I'm hitting the start stream and start I recording button. Really drink. Yeah, as long as the audio is good there. Why, why does it have a red dot? No, because you're streaming and recording. Okay. Oh, shit. I forgot to. Live streaming on YouTube. Uh, do we have a spare Bucci? What? Do we have uh, a spare Bucci? I don't think we do. I don't think we do. Um, Rachel, come back. Get us a spare Bucci. Everyone out there in YouTube world, while you are tuning in, please let us know if you can hear us. Um, for whatever reason, our headphones aren't picking us up, so we can't hear ourselves. Other than IRL world. So you let us know. Uh, Noam says he can hear us. Are we sounding good? Are we sounding extra super duper sexy? I'm turning it on. Yep, we're getting audio. Nice. All right, well, welcome to the Genius Brewing live stream. Uh... I'm gonna grab a like a beer, a hunting class. What's that? A beer or something like that, real quick, and then Michelada. we will be a uh, or a Michelada. Michelada. Heck yeah. Michelada. Grab a breakfast beer, and then we'll get yeah. get rolling as we do. Um, can, can you make me one too, please? Let's uh find this, find that. What do you What do you want as a base beer? Ooh, that's a good question. Caster? Caster with a splash of spicy cider. We don't have the spicy cider on it anymore, do we? No. Yeah, we can do cast, caster. Caster michelada. Or the low cow. Uh, yeah, low cow. Well, that might, that's probably too fruity. Probably. Let's try the coffee, coffee and tomatoes. I like that idea. Um, I'm also gonna I'm gonna turn our ISO up just a little bit, and I'm gonna turn off some of the backlights. Thomas, I agree. Pastry stouts are best breakfast beers. That's true. But a pastry stout michelada. Actually, we do have the... the There's kind of a pastry stout. Uh, yeah. But now I can't see. Oh, Jung Hak Yo, good morning. Thank you so much for the super chat. We appreciate it. Appreciate y'all being here as we get ourselves settled in. Welcome to the live stream, guys. Uh, for those of you who haven't tuned before, we give a, kind of a general news segment, talk about things going on at the Genus Brewing world or the Spokane beer world or the beer world in general while we wait for people to tune in. Then we talk about style of the week. Style of the week is... Well, you're not even talking about that right now because we, we're not there. We got to do like all the other stuff. All right, yeah. fine. Something. The style is going to make... Uh, I know one customer <clears throat> very excited. I uh, saw him yesterday out while I was doing the Valley Cup. Really, really dark. You're really, really dark. Yeah. Uh -huh. That makes it sultry and sexy. It can always come up. Ah, oh, Yes. Got my uh, nice, healthy breakfast of uh, Pop-Tarts here. I chose Boston uh, Cream Donut because that's uh, wonderful. You ever wonder why there's only Pop-Tarts and not Mom-Tarts? It's like there's a goddamn pastryarchy or something. <laughs> it's like popcorn. There's no mom corn either. It's like misogyny. <laughs> Shit. All right. Joke of the week. Bump, bump, bump. Joke of the week. Woo! For those of you that missed that. All right, we're uh, fixing some lights. Uh, we did happen to loan some of our lights to our good friend, uh, regular Logan. Yeah. He's just normal Logan. Yeah, he's, it's not, just he's not Logan. buff Logan or fat Logan or old Logan or any of those Logans. He's just regular Logan. It's just, it's just Logan. He's filming a music video. Wait for that to come out. It is him singing bluegrass. Yeah, it's going to be absolutely wonderful. Imagine bluegrass, but like Dua Lipa outfits. I'm excited. I'm excited. Titillated, you might say. Mm-hmm. Mm, very. Downright titillated. Yeah. So we will be closed today for you. So just going to jump into some Genus Beringi news. Mm. Um, family day. I'm also going to be going out of town pretty soon. So, uh, you know, want to make sure I have spent time to spend with my family before I go out of town. Uh, Reverend KY, uh, for me, I am not buffering. It looks like it might just be on your side. I am buff, but not buffering. Yeah. You got tickets to this gun show? 
Uh, we got a new selection of seller science stuff. I'm actually really excited about all the seller science stuff we just got in. Ooh, yeah. I saw the uh, new wine yeast yesterday, and like I really appreciate uh, for the home winemaking side, seller science naming something of theirs descriptive. Instead of just BM 4x4, yeah, I know what that is. That's going to go for dark, deep Cab Francs, Cab Sauvs. Yeah. But the common customer is going to be like, yay, numbers. And seller science has... Big red. Big red. I mean, you use it for big reds. I, I enjoy yeah. That. Which one's the champagne yeast? Well, it says bubbly Bubbles, red on it, so right? you can figure it out. And they're they are beautiful packaging. I have to yeah. say, I really very enjoy quality their packaging. So, so kudos to you, Seller Science. Uh, not only did we get that, but they also finally have smaller scale stuff of all the enzymes you talk about. So. Their version of Visco Buster, which is a Gluca Buster. Uh, yeah. They got Brutzyme. They got ALDZ, which is a uh, um, prevents the precursors of diacetyl from being formed. That's a Ooh. fun little enzyme. Yeah, that uh, sounds really promising for like hazy IPAs and stuff. We yeah. have to brew a really crappy popcorn uh, diacetyl hazy IPA, use this stuff, and see how much it actually restricts it. Yeah. Like get a whole bunch of hop creep and stuff like that. Too. Yeah, dry hop it and uh, yeah. use USO5 at like 65 degrees. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Crash it too soon. Um, and then Clearzyme, which is their version of Clarity Firm, um, that all is now in small homebrew sized bottles. Oh, and yeah. they've got uh, small bottles of clarifiers that we talk about too. The Glucobuster, uh, we talk about using Optimash. Uh, Optimash just has the beta glucan in it. The Glucobuster also has cellulose and the third one that I forget. Um, so it's got a couple of extra enzymes that work in there. And I will tell you what, the first time I used that, I overused it. It literally plugged up the entire uh, recirculation system because it was so efficient. It was amazing. Uh, and being in the homebrew size is incredible as well because that's just, you know, there you go. Right off the shelves, you guys now have access to the stuff we use. And yeah. So good job, Seller Science, for making that happen. I kind of wonder if they just watch our videos and like, oh, they're talking about that to homebrewers and homebrewers want them. Let's go ahead and do it. In all honesty, it, it, uh, not that they shouldn't be watching us for their own informational purposes, but it would be smart for, you know, uh, hop companies, yeast companies or beer supply companies to watch some people like us or, uh, you know, out to the homebrewers. homebrew for life or something like that, just yeah. to see if there is things people are asking for. I mean, that's a direct reach market. Yeah. Hey, if there's any of you guys that know those guys, you, you should tell them to, to watch us and yeah. follow us and send us stuff to do experiments with so they can get like free marketing. Yes, and they should send us stuff because we enjoy stuff. Speaking of us enjoying stuff, we have an Amazon wish list that's in the yeah, description yeah, below. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, we've gotten some people that have bought us stuff already. Uh, one person had uh, bought us stuff and had an awesome request for a video where we make bread and then we brew beer with the bread. Oh, um, Tim yeah. was supposed to be the one baking the bread, but he got sick. And so I went and um, uh, yeah, nice. basically just filmed while uh, Bread Jesus from the Grain Shed, Sean, uh, Bread Jesus, he makes, uh, made the bread with our farmhouse yeast. Um, taste it amazing, and then we will be uh, next week doing a beer with that bread, and then we're going to show you how to do it. Next week? The week after? Two weeks from now. I don't know. We'll do uh, We got to do, uh, we'll throw it into the Genus Brewing News. Uh, Reese's Puff Porter is coming up soon. We're going to do that nice. for Reese's Day. Uh, I got to do that soon. Reese and I decided that uh, with his situation uh, from Natural 20, with his situation of buying a new brewery, uh, as well as our situation of our kettle eh, not cooperating with us so much on our seven barrel system to do, because also that's Star Wars month, you know, Yeah. Uh, to do the uh, <clears throat> Battle of the Puffs. Oh, okay. You know, so we're each going to brew a version uh, within close guidelines. We'll probably select like this uh, close to the same base recipe on that. Mm -hmm. Maybe more tailored to what we have uh, on hand. Like Reese might use Marisol or wherever we might use Halcyon. Because uh, we're better. Wow, well, you know, we just uh, are going to maybe take a couple of different approaches at it, see if we can reach the exact same beer, the exact same idea, and then you guys are going to decide which one is better on it. And continuing our Pokemon theme, we should uh, use marshmallows in our Reese's Puff and then uh, call it Jigglypuff. <laughs> no, because we're going to use Jiggle Cakes. Oh, there we go. There we go. Yeah. All right. Anyway, that's <laughs> beyond the point. So that's coming up. Uh, we decided to do that. So we got to do that one <laughs> soon. We got to do that this week or... Uh, Especially if I'm using tartan in that, uh, probably about this week we got to do that. So I don't know. We'll go grain shed for uh, Robert Parsons. Uh, yeah, no, don't worry about the re repeated post. We're gonna say hi to you. Good morning. Like, 
number 12. Uh, because yes, he's the 12th also, man on liking for us, supporting us, like he, all of you should like us. Yeah. Uh, also, good morning to everybody else, and do all the likes, like you just said. Yeah. I will. I, it, I'll. I will make a loaf of bread, at least one, ceremoniously to throw into the beer, and we can film most <clears> of that, even if we missed it from the grain shed. I can be like, hey, and here's the amateur way to do it, and dunk. Yeah. Uh, it just, you know, I got taken down. Don't worry. It wasn't COVID. You know, we tested. Yep. We tested. It was a... Uh, I don't test positive for nothing. It was swine flu. Well, except for, you know, the, I mean, the yeah. clap. Yeah. But... And by the way, some of you are second guessing some of our selections that are on that Amazon wish list. I promise you everything on that wish list has a purpose very specific to bring beer. And uh, very, again, very specific. as I typed in the chat, if you buy stuff, let me know on Discord so I can oh, make a request. Oh, Steve, no, forward. this is actually, a and it gives us an, off, an opportunity to <clears> say <throat> uh, Stefan Studemeyer's uh, name again. Um, Bingo. But here he is, uh, Stefan Studemeyer. Uh, how much would one have to spend on your Amazon wish list to get a five barrel live brew day video in undies? And that is a very good question. And you're going to have to take a guess on that. Yep. There's you a couple really big ticket items <clears throat> on there. You, uh, you get <laughs> us what you think that is worth and we'll give you something what we think it's worth and uh, we'll come to a good uh, compromise. But that is not out of the question. In fact, <laughs> I do actually have some good flamingo undies. I will wear for that. Yeah, it, uh, it actually might be encouraged. Uh, I, I will have to wear boots too just because I don't want to burn <clears throat> the ever living crap out of my feet. Uh, especially in a five barrel batch, there's probably going to be some boiling water splashing all over the place. So boots and duct tape. The I was say, boots. And that just makes it sexier. Exactly. <laughs> it makes it more dangerous. The question is, whose five barrel system do we want, do we want to brew on? Yeah. <laughs> just go take over <laughs> somebody's five barrel. Uh, <laughs> hey, right. I'm sure we can figure out someone that would. We could probably. Adam, do it. Adam did say he has a five barrel. Yeah. Oh yeah. Mm. Oh, and is it visible to the people that are patronizing his brewery? No, it's in the. It's it, there's. It's in the very back. That makes it a little bit worse, but... Oh, yeah. But if he's got good internet... All right, anyways. Well, we, depending we on which digress. way we go, too, we could go... I mean, no, it's not five barrel, but we could go to Bottle Bay because then it could be, like, in a dungeon. That's and, true. You know, it could be, like, almost pseudo... We should just do it at Damon's Brewery during... Uh, uh, peak hours. During peak you hours. You probably will get more more people. Yeah. Yeah. All right. <laughs> uh, Fome. And Stefan's on his way to Amazon now. Perfect. Uh, Fomax. Uh, Fomax, what is that? No, uh, Fomax is a, uh, it's the silicone defoamer. The, the silicone. Yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah, so the, yeah, Fomax is their version of the defoamer. Uh, that's like a, uh, firm cap? Yep, firm cap. Nice. Good. I like firm cap. That um, allows me to boil with about yay much headroom in there and live dangerously. I used it yesterday and it was amazing. I too like to live dangerously. Dangerously. All right, so uh, what does that bring us to? Uh, looks like beer of the week. Bum bum bum. Beer of the week. Yeah. Uh, today we're talking about white stouts. White stouts are one of our favorite styles to brew because we've got an in-house coffee roaster who makes coffee only for us and specifically for us. Oh wow! Patrick Sandy just said it's okay if I got sick. He had to be defibrillated. Defibrillated. Wow, that was really hard for me. I'm sorry. Defibrillated? Uh, twice on Tuesday morning. Man. I like, hope you're okay. Yeah. Well, he's here, so he's at least conscious and talking to us. Unless you're pulling one of those ghosts in the machines, and then this is also awesome. Yeah. Either uh, way. But, yeah. But we're help. Yeah. yeah we hope, especially we hope since you're good. we're making a video for you, buddy. Well, yeah. <laughs> that means, all right, um, I'll do it again. That video, we'll get it done within 14 days. Yes. We'll have both of them published within 14 days, and then there's going to have to be a follow-up video for the tasting of the beer. beer. But the beer brew will be one video, one video. and then we'll have a, a follow-up with the tasting. Yeah. All right, man. Not that we're assuming that you're going anywhere, but but yeah, uh, but we feel now we, we feel stuff. like we actually need to be more organized. <laughs> you're guilting us. Uh, it's working. Also, hey what guys, guys, keep keep guilting them. Keep guilting them. <laughs> What uh, what could help us out right now might be might be a beer, might be a beer, might be a beer. A beer could probably help out. I think a lot. I need a beer. <laughs> All right. Man so the beer the of chair. the week. Bum, bum, bum. Man in the chair. Uh, beer of the week. We're going into white stout. Uh, does that actually have a category? No, it doesn't. All right, BJCP, you're failing. 
Specialty is the closest that there's like experimental beer. That's yeah. the closest that you can think of. I mean, it, yeah. Uh, and mm. White Stout, I could also say that's a pretty generally loose term because you, mm. you could really border the line between a coffee beer and a White Stout. But I think there is some things that really make White Stout unique over just a coffee lighted beer. Say like our Caster Muncher or, uh, oh shoot, I forget Georgetown's. That's not as good. Uh, oh, gusto, yeah. gusto, uh, the, the, yeah, gusto crema, gusto oh, crema, cat one. No, gusto crema is for no, right? meows yeah. is uh, IPA. Yeah, gusto crema. Meowza. that's also a good beer name. Like Georgetown, <clears throat> Georgetown's branding, beer names, and stuff like that are just incredible. Those they guys, do a good job. They do a great job. No matter how you feel about Manny's, they do a great job. Manny's is, I mean, Manny's is pretty good too. The one thing I think that bothers me about Manny's is that people think that Manny's is a brewery and they only make one beer called Manny's and it, it's Georgetown. Yeah. It's the, uh, if like, you love uh, it so much, learn the brewery that makes it. It's like Mac and Jack's. Oh man. I love me some Mac and Jack's. Cool. I love black cat Porter too. Mm-hmm. What's that? Well, man. Serengeti wheat, Serengeti wheat's an underrated wheat beer. Oh, Serengeti. I love black I cat. I really do. Serengeti is phenomenal. Uh, the double IPA, I forget the name of that one. That is rum dilly I'll be uh, I'll be at the Seattle airport on uh, next week. So ah. hopefully I'm there during hours that it's open. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, so anyway, White Stout, so. yeah, there's a lot that goes into it, not just the coffee, although the coffee is a really important part, and we'll kind of dig into that down the road. Um, but in general, you're, you're building dark flavors on a light-bodied beer without changing the color, and you can do that with uh, chocolate is one great way to build that. Coffee, um, liquid oak tannin, or any sort of oak in general, but you don't Big want um, you don't want charred oak uh, in any high amount because that will actually color the beer. So liquid oak tannin gives you a lot of that flavor, but without actually darkening the beer. Um, um, no, you won't. Lisa says no, you won't. You well, won't we won't be, we won't be at, uh, Af- at Mac and Jack's during the uh, right hours. Um, and, and then also other flavor boosters like uh, vanilla, for example. Actually, a high sodium and chloride rate will push forward a lot of those dark flavors as well. Uh, so there's a lot of ways to build that, uh, that dark flavor while keeping the beer light. Yeah. Um, and then... That is uh, one of the big things about uh, that we're doing here in White Stout is using a combination of flavors to achieve that big, huge roastiness. And that's, in my opinion, what differentiates it from just a coffee beer. Yeah. When you have a coffee beer uh, like Castor Moose or Gusto Crema, and there's a couple of other ones that are not as good. Uh, uh, question. Does yeah. White Stout require coffee to fit stout? No. no it doesn't require coffee. It doesn't coffee, require. No. That's a good we just question. use coffee to achieve some of that roastiness, but no, it doesn't require coffee at all. Yeah, um, you could use a, technically you could use like black tea and a combination of these other flavors. There's a lot of ways you can go about it, but in general, you're going for that burnt or super or semi-roast quality. Coffee just happens mm-hmm. to be a pretty direct correlation because those dark roasted grains are made very similarly to how coffee is made. Yeah, it, it translates directly. You drink a stout and go, mmm, coffee flavors. So if you put coffee in that, of course you're gonna get some of those flavors coming out of it. But you don't need it. Oh, apparently we're not even going to Seattle at all. Yeah. Dallas, Dallas, Dallas and Phoenix. Dallas and Phoenix. So what I'm hearing is the chat needs to send you guys recommendations on breweries to go visit near those airports. Uh, in the airports. In the airports. In the airports. Yeah, okay. although well, or on, on one somebody of them, could meet you at the airport and just hand you some beer through security there there we go yeah i'll be at, we'll be at dallas airport for like five hours um so you know there's and there again there's a lot of ways to do this uh when we made a blonde <laughs> what could give me a thick mouth feel on a stout that, mm. that was probably an actual question but yeah it's also you say a great thick question. mouth feel I'm and this like, is actually mm. something kind of going into, going into that uh when we made a blonde scottish ale it was weird a uh, scotch ale i mean it was that weird. was a good beer but we used uh, roasted uh, naked oats and blonde roasted naked oats. Blonde, blonde roasted, roasted oats. oats. Blonde roasted oats. And they're blonde. They're light color, but they're roasted. So you get a lot of toasty, toasty good flavors coming out of that. And the natural slickness from the oats is going to give you that extra mouthfeel. Oh, yeah. It was amazing. If you are making white <clears throat> stouts, uh, golden naked oats and the blonde roasted oats, those two things are going to be key i mean you don't have to use them but i love using them because they give you that good stouty feel that good mouth feel to it without sacrificing any color yep uh ham here in the northwest we're serious about our hops all right that that is true 
That is actually true, Daniel. Uh, <laughs> just first one I read. So uh, that is something that we use uh, actually to give some good roast to it is that the uh, blonde roasted oats. Another thing to do is to get some flaked oats, uh, flaked wheat or even flaked barley and toast it yourself. Um, that way you can keep the color really low, but you can really start to build some of those undertone sweet characteristics coming from stouts. Some natural Maillard and give you still the, uh, the dextrinous, the long chain starches that are going to build that body as well. Yeah. Uh, I've got really chapped lips, by the way. So if I'm trying to like hide a smile, it's because I don't want to like over smile and crack my lips open and start bleeding on camera. Yeah. Uh, Nick Gallagher, does clarity matter in a white stout? And I, in my opinion, absolutely not. Uh, it's one of those weird things where it's, uh, it's you know, you, you, you imagine a dark stout and generally speaking, your dark stouts can be a range of either really, really clear and you can kind of see through them or they're just so dark and opaque that, you know, they're there. They're there. Um, so clarity kind of matters to the degree that you want it to matter. I think it's fun to have a crystal clear beer that it looks light and tastes dark. Um, mm -hmm. But at the same time, ours don't. Yeah. They We're throwing so many know. oily things in there that the, you know, the oil should build natural haze regardless. Yeah, and then a lot with the, uh, the oats and the flaked stuff. Yeah. Adds a lot yeah. Of protein There's more protein. Protein. Coffee adds fats and oils to it. If you're adding chocolate in there, that can actually add little bits of uh, haze to it, depending on how you're adding that chocolate, cacao, whatever you want to go for. We'll get into that in a it second. It shouldn't look murky. It shouldn't look yeasty, but outside of that. I, I, I you know, you could go for like as thick as a Hefeweizen haze, but make yeah. sure it's that good like Hefeweizen haze to it and not like there's chunks falling out of my beer. There's chunks in my beer. Uh, type of thing, you know. So, uh, And like Peter said, there is something really fun about getting a white stout that is super crystal clear. And you, you're like, yeah, this is going to be a great blonde ale or cream ale. And you drink it and you're like, holy shit, that's a stout. Yeah. Uh, that's super fun. And that's kind of one of the fun things about white stout is tricking people, tricking your brain and confusing your palate. Uh, when but mostly tricking people. Yeah. I mean, they look at it and go, I want a light beer. And you go, here. And they're like, but but that's dark. And you're like, I know. Or my favorite thing is when they're like, I want a coffee beer. And you give it to them and they're like, what's that? But that I wanted a coffee beer. And like, yeah, that's yeah, it. Yeah, just eat it. Put it in eat your face. Eat it. Get yourself an egg and beat it. Yeah. Don't care if it's funky. Don't care if it's fresh. Uh, all right. Cacao. 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 That's another way to get some really good stouty chocolatey flavors, uh, obviously chocolatey flavors, into your beer. And there's a lot of ways to achieve that. Of course, there's your cocoa nymphs. Uh, and it, actually, this is one of the points where I would suggest cocoa nymphs going into the boil. Most yeah. of the time, I don't like it because it gets overly roasty, overly bitter. But in a white stout, that can kind of be a good thing because you don't have those initial roast and bitter notes. So adding that uh, into the boil, a little bit into the boil, can really help drive forward stout flavors. I was gonna say, we, we might be doing the, the video that Stefan wants. <laughs> oh. Nice. I, I have the item that he purchased. Sweet, I'm and, excited. <laughs> I don't know if you guys want it as a surprise or not, but. Uh, sure, uh, yeah, it's yeah, always we'll, better as a surprise. We'll keep that it as a surprise. That way I don't tense up and, you know. <laughs> yeah, anyway. Who's, who's burrito you need to make sure it's extra warm that day? <laughs> <laughs> I will start doing my research on burritos. Perfect. Uh, Thank so, you, Seven Sotomayor. Um, also, uh, we should mention that uh, we are trying to drink some uh, chocolate beers today in honor of uh, Easter. Yeah. We have the Big Bad Baptist chocolate raspberry stout right now, and this is too cold, but awesome. It's really, I've been really good. Trying to uh, warm sorry, that up. No, I've been trying to warm it up a little bit, but that's also something that uh, that's something that I you should think about. Bar last night. <laughs> yeah, no, it's all right. Uh, it's something that you should think about while drinking is what is the best temperature to drink it at. White stouts should be drank at a little higher temperature to fully give you all the good flavors in there. Yeah. All right, cacao. Uh, by the way, Steady Flow, can I just mention this new uh, sticker branding? I think it's pretty dope. It is. Did they come to us? Huh? Did they come to us? N no, they did Matt bought them. Yeah. Steady Flow Growler House. Well, no, 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 no. Did, did they come to us for the sticker design? 
No, oh, no, I don't think so. Well, then it's a little bit less cool, but it's still pretty awesome. Yeah, good job, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, it was amazing. Now it's just awesome. Now it's just really it's cool. It's just awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's super cool. Uh, all right, cacao. So throwing a little bit of the cocoa nibs into the boil to get the tannins uh, in there, to actually get the bitterness to help drive those stout flavors forward. And you get some deep chocolate notes too, depending on where you throw it in the boil. Um, but the one thing you do miss on that is that big, like I'm opening up a fresh, nice chocolate bar aroma that you get from doing a dry halt. Hail's closed? Yep. No. no. All right. So I'm sorry. I'm sorry I interrupted Peter, but this is actually a little bit of a heartbreak. This is pretty close uh, heartbreak to me too, personally. Hale started over here in this area. Uh, yeah. They had most of their stuff up in Colville for a while, where they got uh, you know big and famous. And that's where another Spokane kind of institution guy uh, got his start. Yep. Um, and he's I'm forgetting his name right now. Uh. Oh. Why? I, so, I, so I know the uh, um, the Benedito's guy also worked with him too yes. way back in the day. Yeah, so uh, I don't know why I'm forgetting that. He actually played baseball for my dad in high school. I've known him a long <clears> time. <throat> he got his start at Hales. He started Northern Lights Brewing Company, which eventually turned into No Lie. Uh, and then, you know, he just decided to want to be a brewer and not Benedito's. Hales is pretty near and dear to the Spokane beer scene. They they started a lot of good stuff over here. That is super sad to see that they went down. Yeah, it's also a easy brewery for a lot of people to get into. Yeah, yeah. El they, Jefe yeah, made very very uh, yeah approachable. Always beers. loved El Jefe Mongoose, <clears throat> the Super Goose, the Super Goose, Super Goose. Man, oh, man, that is sad. That is absolutely sad. Mm -hmm. All right, beer to him. Um, anyways, back, <laughs> back to drink, back to, I did First. drink, I did drink. Okay. I drink, I, right. I have quick sips. Whatever. Uh, all right. Yeah. So going back to, uh, Coco, cacao, cacao. Jinx five. Yummy. Uh, you can't talk until I say a name. Tim. All right. Well, that lasted long. <laughs> all right. Uh, so, uh, talking about, uh, the best way to get aroma that is using the cocoa nibs in dry hop, you get that powdery cocoa aroma that feels like you're freshly opening a really good quality, you know, bag of little chocolate bites. Um, but, uh, that, and that also does that without adding any color. That's the nice mm -hmm. thing about nibs. Uh, so boil, you get flavor, you get tannin, you get bitterness, kind of like you would from all the roast grains in a stout. Dry hop, you get that nice, pleasant chocolatey aroma that kind of builds, especially if you've got any sort of vanilla in the beer also. And that's uh, what I would also recommend. I mean, a <clears throat> combination of layering flavors. And then think about the vanilla that you're adding in, too. Uh, this would be a really good point to use something that's bigger and richer, like a Mexican vanilla that has those deep tobacco-y, like, mm -hmm. dark chocolate notes, rather than something like uh, just kind of a vanilla blend that's more like vanilla ice cream or even like a Tahitian vanilla that's cherry and fruity. Um, so that's a, another way to think about how you can start boosting the chocolatey, cocoa-y flavors coming out of there. Um, good questions on roasting grains. Uh, most of the time uh, when I toast grains, toasted oats, toasted wheats, whatever, in my oven at home, it's very, very low. Try to get them on a super thin layer. Normally, uh, I take some tin foil, crush it up, then lay it out so you got those nice ridges, get some good airflow. Uh, get a really super thin layer. 200 250 at max generally for me and then every uh probably about half an hour or so i go in and i toss them up and toss them around that way the gases that are releasing uh can be uh, released from the bottom of it and nothing gets overly toasted most of the time when i'm toasting them i'm going by my nose uh, they should get a nice light golden color but it should also start to t turn <clears throat> into kind of cookie sweet flavors You'll be smelling it, especially oatmeal, well, oats. Yeah. There'll be oatmeal, 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 toasted oats, oatmeal cookie. cookie. And when it gets that cookie aspect, even in the wheat, even in the barley, the rye, when you start to get that cookie aspect, that nice sweet smell aspect out of it, it's done, pull it out, that's when you should use it. Uh, you can do it higher. Uh, Reverend KY was asking if you could yeah. do it at 350 on a brew day. That's how I do it, because it's quicker, not because it's better. 
Yeah, uh, it's quicker when you do things quicker. They're a little bit less controllable. You have to be more aware. You have to be more on it. Yeah, so it's usually about know. 10 to 15 minutes at 350. So 325 to 350, 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, uh, again, still going by your nose. And that's the quick way to do it. And while roasting your nibs, that's a really good idea is to roast some cocoa nibs too in there. I think Express that's an oils, all right. Yeah. I mean, I'd almost say pan toasting would work just as well. But. Yeah, pan toasting might be a little hot. I might enjoy roasting the nibs just a little bit lower just because uh, cocoa, cocoa butter, cocoa fat yeah. melts at such a low temperature. It's like 86 degrees mm. that maybe a little bit 250, 275. I could go for a 325, like nice kind of roast on there and chuck them in right away. Don't give any time for any oxygen <clears throat> or anything like that to get to it. All right. Uh, is a white chocolate, white stout too cringe? And actually, no, we've done that before. And there is an amazing brewery that I think is super underrated, uh, Ordnance Brewing Company in Boardman, Oregon. And if you are ever driving through northeastern Oregon, there is nothing up there except for good melons. And I mean that, good melons in the Hermiston. There's also really good pork yeah. uh, right over there. Uh, Ian Pendleton's right there, so there's a great roundup. Anyway... Bo There's nothing in Boardman, Oregon, except for a great brewery. Go visit Ordnance, drink some Ordnance beers. They make some great beers. Block Fisky, oh, Block Fisk and Block Fisky, both those two beers are criminally underpriced. Yeah. Underpriced. They're incredible. Uh, well, I'm not going to say Russian. Imperial Stouts. Ukrainian. And, uh, yeah, bourbon barrel aged uh, Imperial know. Stout. It, some country wonderful. over there. But they make one called White Crow. It's a white coffee, <clears throat> white stout. Uh, white coffee, white chocolate, white stout. And it is amazing. I love that one. That really turned me on to white stouts. Yeah. I also just personally don't like white chocolate. And so it is for me, but that's because I don't like white chocolate. Uh, white chocolate is very hard to achieve in a beer because all it is is fat. It's yeah, fat. It's chocolate fat. It's fat and vanilla. It's so it's hard to translate into that beer. Uh, most people, when that comes across, it just becomes gross, fatty, oily, slick beer. It's, it's, not There's easy. a way to do it. Ordnance found a way to do it, and if you want to do it, go find theirs, buy it, drink it, and then decide for yourself if it's too cringe. Um, so we've talked about coffee a little bit. We've talked about cacao. Uh, we haven't talked too much about liquid oak tannin. So liquid oak tannin is a product that is relatively new to the market. And there's a company actually in Spokane that's starting up that's going to make pure liquid oak, which is like a whole different level. Oh, yeah. It's not oak tannin. It's liquid oak. Uh, oak tannin is like an alcohol derived um, absorption of all the good flavors you get off of uh, oak this person found a way to liquefy actual oak and so you're getting that oak aged quality right in your beer without um this without the solventiness that comes from an extract um but uh, an oak tannin or an oak extract um, those work pretty well too especially in the white stout category because they build body and they build a little bit of aggression with uh that's uh you know along the same vein as a stout without adding color uh, if you can find a nice light one that can come with some chocolate and some uh, some coffee notes as well that's going to all just build into that same profile while giving you a little bit of tannin to exemplify uh, like a dark roasted grain and even a small barrel age quality yeah that's a, i mean that, uh, and dark. colorlessly yeah relatively colorless relatively colorlessly that's another thing that we use in that is the oaks to really start to do that. Even if you can't necessarily get a hold of an oak, an oak tannin, a liquid tannin or anything like that uh, right off, using uh, a sweeter oak liquor will really help too. Mm -hmm. uh, Baco rum. Oh my God, I love yeah. that stuff. Uh, Baco would be a thing that jumps right into my mind right there. You're getting some really nice oakiness, some sweetness. A Solara rum would probably work really well too. Um, I'm suggesting rums first over bourbons just because bourbons are so strong in flavor. That will turn into more of a bourbon stout and you're going to lose a little bit more of the oakiness. A well-selected $20, $25 rum can probably give you a better quality than like a $60 to $80 bourbon and that's kind of where the price range is where you don't just kind of taste you know weird jim beaminess yeah in your so, beer in your beer if uh, you're shooting it i mean you can get some really quality stuff at like 30 bucks but yeah and the, uh, the bourbon will work really well too if you want to make you know a bourbon barrel white stout because those are also fairly enjoyable and that's a great way to trick somebody into thinking that it's also a stout it's really tricking your brain into thinking these flavors make dark beer flavor um, 77 Tram Zam guy, morning to you as well. Sean Huntley, hey, here's uh, some cool, no, good, oh yeah, 
Uh, now for some good, uh, just turn it to off. So hit mode, mode. until it's off. I don't know where. Mode, mode until it's off. Uh, now for some good news. Ribald Brewery just opened up. Interesting mix of normal fare and sours. So that's some cool new addition to the beer world. Yeah. It'll, yeah, it'll, yeah, it'll just come down. give it some time. Sorry, we're going to have a little bit of extra background noise for a second. Um, ooh, what are your thoughts on tequila and a white stout? First of all, we ooh, both love tequila, so yeah. um, yes, but that would be tremendously difficult to pull off. I, the deal about that is tequila is such an imposing flavor to the roasty toastiness mm. uh, of most stouts. Uh, it can be done, but what I think would probably be better on that would be a softer mezcal. Uh, What's catching that? some of that smokiness rather than the sweet fruitiness from the tequila. I think to do it, you'd ha it'd have to be like a fruited white stout, which gets into a whole different color category. Um, but I'm thinking like, what's that rose uh, bottle oh, that's got yeah, the raspberry? Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's I, a tequila. Know, it's a there, there's it's a tequila-based liqueur that's got like raspberry notes into it. Too. I think a flavor to kind of give it that stout color. At this point, you're getting into. I mean, there's no way to add all these flavors without getting into like almost amber care territory but still if you can do it without you know really making it a dark beer then it'll do be it give us some and then we'll tell you our thoughts on it yeah uh, there is a way to do it uh i think if you're doing that you might have to go more in a mole um area get a little bit of chocolate see if you can get a little bit of nuttiness uh in there and then get the tequila in the background that could be really good yeah uh but yeah Vanilla. Uh, well, other herbs and flavors. Other herbs and flavors uh, getting into it. There's a lot of other things that taste like other things that you can get in there. Actually, uh, hazelnut. Uh, That's a great flavor carrier, too. So it's yeah. got a good flavor by itself, but it'll also pick up a lot of other flavors and bring you into that stout category really, really well. So hazelnut's awesome. Yeah. Uh, some of the other nutty characteristics adding into this can really start to take it into... Uh, Stout ten, kit, ten, stay, well, Tanner, I, you got me thinking. I'll get on that in a second because we're <laughs> actually in the right area for that and herbs and other flavors. Uh, but, yeah, that can start to carry it into uh, the really nice dark er uh, area of that. Um, some of other bittering herbs that are really harshly tannic, uh, heather. Um, Heather's a little bit fruity, but Heather could go into there a little bit. You could probably use something like mugwort or wormwood to get aggressively bitter, but you want to be very, very careful using some of those guys because they get bitter fast. Uh, I can tell you from experience in a five gallon batch, you maybe want to use a half a gram of wormwood and that might be too much. Uh, it is aggressive. B, aggressive. B, E, aggressive. So, B, E, A, G, R, E, S, S, But uh, Tanner's comment that stopped me a little bit. What would you think of a heavy dry hopped white stout? And with the right dry hops, that could actually uh, work really, really well. Four, seven, twos. Four, seven, twos jump immediately to mind. Elixir could be in there too. Um, also something like Sabro. Now what's unique to these <coughs> kinds of hops is they're actually very high tannic. They're very high woody. I could also see something like spalt uh, because it's very spicy going in there. Yeah, go, going classic on that. Uh, uh, I really like the, uh, you know, any of, there's some new experimentals that have that high tan and they have, they come across with, uh, you know, tasting notes like shoe leather and, uh, uh, you know, oak, wood. Like they have, they have a lot of uh, um, interesting flavors that aren't going to be that heavy tropical Jeez. fruit, heavy myrosine, heavy dank, all the flavors that would combat. Um, you know, that, that nice stout kind of character. Yeah. Uh, Sabro would be really nice because it's so coconut forward, especially in the dry hop that you're, I mean, you're going to get more of a coconut white stout, but coconut flavors generally go with that chocolatey flavor. <clears throat> and that's a good way to trick the brain into thinking this is a dark beer. Yeah. I love four seven twos. If you can get a hold of HBC four seven two, start using that in your dark beer and it will be amazing. Stefan, well, Lamet would be interesting, and so Lamet's one of my favorite hops for a whole different range of reasons, but yes, that could probably work, and the Hallertau Blanc. Uh, the Hallertau That'd Blanc be, is going to be a little bit too fruity and yeah. fruit forward. If we go on the tequila fruit train, then I think Hallertau Blanc, Blanc could be amazing. Could be the one. Yeah, that could be really good on that. If you are going fruit train, actually, Hallertau Blanc might work really well. The well, Lamet oh, we got, is check a it out. little we got, too spicy. Ah, Nobody else joined. 
We got 69 uh, people watching. Nobody leave, nobody join. That's right. Uh, or unless, you know, we can get it to 169. Yeah. Anyway. Or uh, 696. Ooh, yeah. A touch of anise would also really help. Uh, mm-hmm. That could be a really good thing to add in, too. Uh, chicory. Uh, that could be an awesome thing to add in. Chicory or any other barks uh, like that that you could get some birch. Actually, birch bark would be pretty fun to add in there. Go on the light side for them. You know, you don't want to yeah. overdo it. Also, all these things are going to add some color too. So be mindful of the color amounts that you're adding while you're building flavors. It's not just like add them all in and see what happens. Like, select what you need, use only what you need, and get all the flavor that you need to build a develop, developed beer while maintaining mm-hmm. the color and integrity of the base beer. That is one thing you are going to do have to pay much more attention to the color of it. You can get golden, but you shouldn't go much darker than that because darker than that, it's starting to get a look a little brown and it's going to be off. It's going to be unappealing to the eye. All right. We talked a little bit about vanilla and uh, selecting a uh, specific uh, region of vanilla to use in, but I also kind of want to talk uh, about types of vanilla like uh are you adding vanilla extract vanilla flakes vanilla beans Mm -hmm. and a lot of the time i am against vanilla beans Uh, i am i am for the bean itself i am against the pot because the pot is very woody the pot is very tannic yeah but this could be a place that actually is decent to have a light exposure to the vanilla pod as well yeah and you usually have to be a little bit of aggressive to open up the pot the bean you know the bean pod and so while you're flicking the bean it just doesn't uh well, it all depends. Some beans need a nice delicate touch where you start at the top and then you just whoop around and scoop down through the bottom. Yeah. So it depends on what type of bean you have. Uh, maybe you have to cigarette hold it and then work <laughs> it until it opens up and then you can just pull it down. Yeah, some uh, beans are more exposed or less exposed. And so you really have to, you know, you have to really yeah. know the right touch to make sure that that bean gives you access. So uh, most of the time in that, uh, the beans are the actual tiny little specks on the inside of the pot. And a lot of home brewers just grab a pod, chuck it in. And they're like, why does it taste like wood? Because you added that pod in there without exposing the beans. And you added too much of the pod and too much contact time with it because it's high tannic and very, very woody. But this is a style that could work really well. Getting the, uh, using the vanilla beans as a longer age, but actually having that pod have a day or two of contact time to give you some of those woody uh, tannic qualities to it could be a really good way to go. <laughs> rub, rub the nibs and flick the bean. Got it. Uh, uh, but yeah, there's a lot of different ways to, to add vanilla. So, so in a white stout, I think powderiness, if you're going for a white chocolate white stout, the vanilla powder is actually a really good addition. Um, oh, yeah. Partly because of the texture it's going to give you as well. Um, uh, but I, I prefer a nice, if it's a good quality extract, honestly, just good vanilla extracts are going to be cheaper, easier to use, easier to integrate, and usually taste better. Usually on that. Uh, By the way, we get our uh, uh, extracts from Beanilla.com and Vanilla Beans for using Vanilla Beans as well. But extracts, Beanilla.com. They don't, but they should, but they don't, uh, you know, uh, pay us anything. This is not really an endorsement for them, but Beanilla is awesome. They just do the best job, and Uh, so we keep plugging them. Yeah, and they do have really good, fairly priced uh, vanilla on that. They own their own farms, so they actually pay their farmers a good wage, and they can still charge less for you uh, on that. They're a good good place to go, good people to support. Yeah. Uh, all right, Patrick <clears throat> Sandy had an idea of fig and honey for a white stout, and I really enjoy that, especially thinking about the type of honey that you're using in there. Uh, getting something a little bit more, again, uh, woody and aggressive. I think even a touch of buckwheat might be fun, yeah. but a touch, a tiny touch. Don't overdo it. Alfalfa honey. Oh, yeah. Get some of that grassiness in there. Yeah. If you're good, I would say stay away from like an orange blossom honey in this instance. Because, Unless you go into the fruit tequila thing, which, you which, know. Oh, man, that could be really good. Is there like a lemon blossom honey or a lime blossom honey? I would love for somebody to send us a lime blossom honey. I imagine it. I mean, we, t- we tried the, all the honeys from the guy that Thomas oh, brought from oh Hawaii. God, yes, we got a lot of honeys from Hawaii. There was that passion fruit yeah, honey. They, they are incredibly variant. Oh. So I did not know how variant honeys could be until this guy came in with like 30 different honeys. He has like random honey farms all around Hawaii that use different tra- like local plants, plants. Yeah. to make their honey. 
it's a, it was absolutely incredible. I, mean, I think we tasted probably somewhere near 20 different honeys. They were yeah. all unique, all incredible. And that's actually something, if you're thinking about the fig and honey, uh, to think about a specific type of honey in there to really add some more robustness and some of those dark flavors. Yeah. Do you think that there is like a cacao honey out there that the bees like pollinated? I bet uh, there is. I'm, I'm Googling it now, but the lime blossom honey is also known as linden tree honey. Linden tree honey. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of like the, uh, send that us one present. Kind of like linden, that one. Linden bee honey. Uh, honey. Yeah. That, that's, he's a president, right? He was sweet. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> also, the fig, uh, that's an exciting flavor to use in that because of all the umami flavors you can get out of that. Those really nice, deep, dark, figgy flavors. Uh, it, just it, be careful you don't go too far on to the uh, color wheel. Yeah. Um, yes, there is a... Cacao honey? Cacao honey that's actually from Hawaii because there's a 486-acre Hawaiian chocolate farm. Uh, why didn't... Uh, James, James Wall, if you are watching this or if one of your cohorts is watching this and they know you, send them this video, James. Next time you come back or just mail us some of the uh, chocolate honey, please. Yeah, or if, so, or if Thomas is... Me to do this. Yeah. 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 Or, or reach Thomas. out to Thomas. Thomas can find it for us. Thomas can find it for chocolate us. Chocolate honey. Um, what were we talking about? Uh, we were talking about presidents. honey. Uh, well, you know, the honey. Honey and presidents. Yeah, yeah. I need. Uh, I'm Fun fact which president invented honey? <laughs> this is why I'm responsible for the fun facts around here. <laughs> 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 all right. Are we going on to topic number uh, one? Uh, cardamom. Actually, um, cardamom might be an interesting so that's a deal in white stouts uh pastry stout white stout can be adopted to pastry stout super super easy <clears throat> and super super deliciously if you ever thought a pastry stout was a little bit too heavy and a little bit too sweet adopt it into the white stout and it'll probably hit spot on for you i really enjoy that idea right there reverend ky says maui brewing is coming to washington maybe they can hook it up oh send them over okay rev because <clears throat> you have a better chance of seeing them than we do you need to send them over and send them here and uh, send them with uh beer and honey yes all oh, of it Stephen sotomayor freestyle white stout recipe please easy we're going to start with heidelberg because you, you want to start with the lightest base um that way when you start adding color with all the other things then you've got to uh you also want to start with a really nice poofy base too so heidelberg is better than your classic two row or uh yep. oh no it's got a little bit more body to it uh, i was thinking halcyon maybe uh halcyon but halcyon's gonna be a little bit darker so you you, you can yeah. start with 1.2 or you can start with 2.5 as a base mall i just like starting with the lightest, lightest possible, possible. Thing. And I'll be, you know, we'll build well, with some oats. Oats also are light. Also on that, uh, like Heidelberg, because Halcyon's a lot sweeter, Heidelberg <laughs> is going to allow you to play with some of the sweetness in the adjunct malts and in the specialty malts rather than just getting it all from your base. Yeah. So, all right, sorry, go. Uh, if I'm freestyling a recipe, I'm going to go 10 pounds of Heidelberg. I'm probably going to go like a pound and a half of uh, either naked oats or just flaked oats um, or flaked barley. Uh, and then I'm probably going to leave a little bit of room for uh, some unmalted wheat or um, a combination of unmalted wheat and acid malt. Acid malt. So let's say 10 pounds of Heidi, uh, 1.5 of, let's just go with the lightest thing, which is going to be flaked barley. And then let's go um, six ounces of uh, unmalted wheat and two ounces of acid malt. That's all going into the mash. Can be mashed normally. Uh, hop wise, let's just go ahead and say uh, we're using four seven twos. I'm not going to use a lot of them. Probably an ounce each at maybe 30 minutes and 10 minutes. I don't know. Uh, and everything's going to happen post. And so uh, as I'm uh, bringing it to the end of a boil, uh, for the last five minutes, I might add, add in some cocoa nibs. Uh, probably about a two ounces of cocoa nibs. Um, uh, that'll go through all the way in the cool down. If I wanted to add anything like extra, like heather or uh, even black tea, a small amount of black mm. tea, um, that's where that's going to happen. I'm going to be planting a small amount of vanilla, probably Mexican vanilla, also dry hopping um, with cocoa nibs. And then the last day, the day before we keg it, um, that's when I'm going to add about one ounce of a light roast coffee. Uh, and then 12 hours later, it's in the package and it's tasting good. Uh, very key on the light roast there because you're getting all of those really great coffee aromas. You're staying in the chocolate. You're staying in the nutty <clears> realm. 
uh, rather than going into the harsh, astringent, uh, aggressive realm. Yes. And then it's very important to taste your beers. It's going in the packaging so you can slightly minor dose it with things to boost it. Maybe it's just a little bit too tannic. So you got to add a scotch of vanilla to boost it up just a little bit here. Uh, or you need just a little bit more tannin. So Step inside of my little... cheers and thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, you need a little bit more tannins in there. So you're adding a little bit of oak or a little bit of that rum to kind of get it in there. So white stouts are a lot more fine tuning than uh, what you, you know, you think they should be because there is a whole lot that's going in here to mimic other flavors. This is a pretty good one. We're now drinking uh, Mexican chocolate death. This comes from a place in uh, Ellensburg that actually kind of helped me get my start into professional brewing uh, a long time ago while going to school down there. There's a nice fun college called Central Washington University. Uh, if you like going nowhere, as far as being in a small town that's in the middle of nothing, that is a phenomenal place. And I don't mean that as an insult. It was awesome. You just kind of walk out into the plains, swim in the Yakima River, uh, watch the guy at Iron Horse Brew until he offers to buy you beer to help him work instead no of just watching him. Brew. You can't watch him brew anymore? Well, you couldn't watch him brew in the first place where they were. I just went in back and drank beer and watched him until he got irritated enough. He's like, hey, can I buy that for you if you help me with this? And then I did because it was like free beer and you're going to let me help you brew? Yes. Thank you, Iron Horse. I appreciate that. I really do. Uh, this is a good version of death. No, most yeah. of the time I'm not uh, really too much about Irish death. It's Well, they got a, they got a new brewer. I want to say this is probably like four or five years ago now. Um, yeah. And ever since then, I, I no longer have butter deaths. That is 100% true. <clears throat> I'll tell you, one thing that irritates me about Irish death is being there and being with them. There were so many better beers than Irish Death that it was just like, why are you drinking that when this is so much more tasty? Ah! It was the original, like, beer branding. Like, you know, everything that Portland makes fun of, like, videos about yeah. Portland make fun well, of. Like, I'll take the baby, baby piss yeah, what, what it really, or whatever. What it really was, uh, being there and watching it happen, what it really was, Irish Death is actually really light of a dark beer. It's very light, very crushable. Very it was 7.2%. And it was three fifty at the bars in Ellensburg. Three fifty everywhere you went. That is why this sold so well. Uh, and g granted, you know, going to the brewery and getting something like the Copperopolis, which was just phenomenal, or the Imperial IRA before India Red Ales were a thing. That was incredible. Were more expensive. Well, more alcoholic. Were more expensive. So. I get why death went on it, but Copperopolis should not have gone by the wayside for Irish death. And that's my gripe. Anyway, this is super delicious, though. This is really good. Go out and get yourself some of the Mexican chocolate. Death. Good job, Iron Horse. Yeah. It has the right amount of cinnamon to the nose, too. Yeah, yeah. just a little bit. Coming and the chocolate's soft. The overall beer is soft. It's not super roasty. It's just like it's a, a very approachable beer that's got all the flavors you want. Yeah. Um, Dallas, to answer your question, if you're starting all grain, I would probably average most of my recipes to 12 pounds of grain. Yeah. That's I say my four generally five gallons that I usually do because I have the smaller boys. I'm usually about ten to eleven pounds. Yeah, for yeah. a five, yeah, and I was I build my recipes to five point two five gallons just to account for loss. Um, but uh, yeah, twelve pounds of grain. If you have crappy efficiency, that's a five percent beer. If you got really really good efficiency, it's a seven percent beer. All your beers are going to fit into that range. Build to twelve pounds, and you'll be good. Brewer's friend is also really nice. Uh, if you can't. <clears throat> If you're looking for free recipes that are all over the scale, uh, you can get onto our brewer's friend. I knew uh, that was gonna happen. Don't worry. Our light went out. Uh, you can get onto our brewer's friend and look up all of our recipes. Uh, we even have some standardized recipes transformed into all grain extracts that are super easy and super simple for anybody to brew. Uh, so that's a great resource as well. But yeah. All right, uh, now we are on to topic number one. Bum, 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 topic number one. We kind of already talked about it a little bit, but... A little bit. Uh, more stuff to go into it, like the extracty parts. Yeah, so uh, we, our topic number one fitting in with the holiday is chocolate and beer. Uh, Paul Peter is wandering around looking confused. Let's get into it. Chocolate and beer for Easter. We're drinking some chocolate beers right now. We have talked about nibs. 
Uh, nips can go all over the place. We talked about using them in boil and dry hop, uh, kind of what happens there. Let's move into powdered cacao. Now we're talking about ah. using something like Hershey's baking chocolate. This is an option. Uh, Peter has actually done it. Uh, I forced him to make an inch. No, did you use it in the enchilada stout? No, I get it. No? Yeah. I sure did. Well, I it's that... on the video. Watch the enchilada video. Yeah. Uh, I need to redo that beer. Like that, that actually was, was a really good beer. That was a, that was probably one of my favorites out of the Willard. That was a great beer. Yeah. We could probably partner with like De Leon to give us enchiladas. Hell yeah. And then we can eat enchiladas while making enchilada beer. Yeah. That is oh, where I bought everything. Day I can be here, right? And we'll, uh, you know, we'll stand Maybe. next to our wives and enchilada our way closer to them. Yeah. <laughs> That was smooth. That was smooth. I actually really enjoyed that one. Yeah, that was, that was something. Good. That was good. Yeah, it's uh, something fun to talk about. Uh, all right. So uh, <clears throat> powdered. Uh, there's a lot of different forms out there. Uh, you can actually use some hot chocolate mixes. Uh, talking about Mexican hot chocolate stouts to make our Mexican hot chocolate stout, which is better than Death, but Death is really good. They're actually two very unique beers, and I would enjoy them both separately. Uh, we use Spiceology's Mexican hot chocolate mix yeah. that you just make hot chocolate out of. The one deal about using hot chocolate mixes or using any of the chocolate mixes is you have to be aware of fat contents and oil contents in them. Uh, some of them, what is it, uh, Swiss Miss or Nesquik? Swiss Miss. Swiss Miss has fats and oils inside of it. Palm oil, I believe. Uh, I might be wrong about that, but it has fats and oils in it. And so that if you use Swiss Miss in your beer, you're going to be getting fats and oils in it. What could give you a rancid flavor, it could give you an overly slick flavor, an overly meaty flavor. In addition, 90% of the flavor content of Swiss Miss is sugar, which means it doesn't end up in your final, final beer anyway. Yeah, uh, you also do have to account for that. Look on the back of the box and think, yeah, I have this many grams <clears throat> of sugar that I'm adding into my beer. You need to account for that in your final gravity and all that kind of fun stuff. Uh, but that is something you can use. Do keep in mind, though, if you're using a powdered cacao, if you're using a dark chocolate, a Hershey's baking powder or a Nestle baking powder, something like that, it can get very gritty if it survives all the way through into the final beer. Uh, personally, I found baking chocolate, baking cacao to be a gravelly flavor, a gravelly texture in any of the beers that I've had it in. Uh, it's a little more sandpapery, um, which could be a desired thing. Most of the time, it just it doesn't feel the best to me, texturally. Yeah. In the mouth, it doesn't feel the best. It doesn't. I would rather have the smoothness of a nib in boil and dry hop going sliding down the back of my throat than yeah. the grittiness trying to struggle through that. <laughs> yeah. A little bit of a reflex there. You know, it's not what you want in beer. Yeah. Uh Pioneer Brew and Barbecue, Dutch, Dutch Processed process cocoa. cocoa. I've actually used this quite a few times, the liquid Dutch cocoa. <clears throat> I absolutely and utterly love the yeah. flavor of it going in. That is aggressive, aggressive stuff. And I love it because of that. It incorporates really well. Uh, that is a different flavor of cocoa, though. That is also something you have to be thinking about is the flavor of this cocoa. Uh, is the flavor are you going to get a better flavor using the dutch process which is this really nice aggressive not quite dark chocolate not quite milk chocolate but a little way, ways in between would you be better with the dark chocolate aggressiveness of the powdered cocoa or the milk chocolatiness of a dry hop nip uh it depends on your beer where where you're going with that that is something you got to think about in there uh, um, one good way to test out any of these uh, cocos or cocoa powders is actually just blend them with alcohol. So if yeah. there's an alcohol that's going to go well with any chocolate beer that you're making, go ahead and use these in the alcohol. It'll do two things for you. First of all, if there's natural oils in the Swiss Miss, for example, which is not the one that you want to use, uh, but uh, let's say you're playing around with Swiss Miss and there's natural oils into it, alcohol will help separate that out, meaning you can... Uh, either dab a coffee filter into the top to absorb the oils, or you can just decant in a way that makes it so that you can pull from the center where none of the oils are going to be. Uh, a tincture will also pull out all the right flavors that you want, and sometimes, not all the time, sometimes leave behind some flavors that you don't want. So a tincture is a great way to experiment with different cacaos and see if they're going to work well in your chocolate. 
pl or in your beer. Plus, you can taste them before you add them to your beer. So yeah, are you 486? Could you just make the hot <clears throat> chocolate and add it in to finished beer? Yes, but you're watering down your finished beer. Then you're going to be adding sugars into your finished beer, which will kick fermentation back up. And so then you'll have to wait for it to ferment out anyway. And you'll still have the exact same problem with the fats and oils, if the fats and oils are still there. Uh, if I'm adding in a hot chocolate powder, generally I'll add it into two places. I like to add most of it into the end of the boil. That way it actually mixes in. I do also add, like to add a little bit in of it into like a third of it in the uh, tail end of fermentation just to preserve some of the aromatics. When you add it in at the end of the boil, yeah, it all mixes in, but you're also losing some of the volatile aromatics off of that. So I like to add an, a scotch back into the back end to make sure I preserve those aromatics. Pamela Hakla, have you ever used Mexican chocolate, e.g. Abuelita? Abuelita! Uh, yes, it's not very soluble, which is the hard part behind that. And so it'd be one of those, like, you'd have to start it off with some boiling hot water and then maybe add some liquor to it and then try to get it into the beer. So worth a try, very difficult. 77 Trans Am guy, this is a really good comment. Could you use a light beer and try to mix it with a powdered mix? Yes. Uh, uh, it's a good way to experiment. Yeah, and Pamela, to get back onto that thing, I've had a bunch of those. I've actually bought some of the some of the uh, Mexican street versions, I guess you can say. Uh, some of them from Mexico, different versions of that. Uh, we actually went to a chocolate factory down there, and I got some from there. The problem with using some of those things, like Peter said, they're a lot less soluble, but they also really do have high chocolates and fat, uh, high chocolate fats in there. The chocolate fats and oils which allows all that cocoa to be pressed together like that into that disc uh so personally when i've i've done a lot of mexican hot chocolate beers because i just love the style so much i have found that using something like a abuelita uh, the pressed chocolate like that just has too much fats and oils to be the best around but you can use a uh, spiceology's uh, mexican chocolate powder absolutely and... beautiful because it has all those fats and oils taken out of it and uh, if i'm going to make the mexican actually i don't spiceology i might do that one too because they have such high quality stuff but if i'm going to make it to drink it a bledita is mm, amazing for beer, I'm going to go for the Spiceology route just because I want to avoid what makes that so good and rich and delicious when you're drinking it by itself, I the fats and oils. I get some of the Spiceology people to come on. Yes. Yeah. Get and them we'll collab yeah. a beer with them. Whatever they want, they can literally just hand us spices and say make beers out of this and we'll do it. Yep. We'll make a spice beer and a beer spice. Yes. Well, I know two or three of the sales reps already. Uh, yeah. I wonder if we could do like a hop salt. For them. Uh, like collab with them on a hop salt? That would be really cool. I don't know that they have a hop salt yet. They do have beer spices with Derek Wolf, but Derek Wolf is we could bring him in to make them better. He's a really good barbecue person, but he's not a beer person. So they should collab with us to make the beer spices instead of a barbecue person. But we could also bring the barbecue person in with us to collab beer, barbecue, and spice. Yes. And if he comes into barbecue, we can eat that. I will okay, travel yeah, to I his place. I will show you some Derek Wolf stuff. Like, oh my God, over the fire cooking. Yeah. We'll, we're going to watch this after we're done. Uh, all right. Anybody who knows anybody on social media, go find them and then make us go to them and then we'll make videos for them and or then I'll just message eat food. Yeah. Sales reps. Uh, yes, Reverend KY, them. what you're thinking is, is <clears throat> Zocava. Uh, I actually have uh, two of the Zocavas. I think I have the charred oak one and the regular one. Um, no, that was really nice. The Sean Huntley, one? do you know of any beers with horseradish? Yes, both Peter and I have made beers with horseradish. Yep. We made uh, beers with wasabi. And, li with and a little puss. Octopus. Oct octopus. Oh, octopus yeah. Yeah. I need to watch yeah. that movie. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, that, that was, was that? A shameless. <laughs> that was shameless. Anyway, let's move on. Did that get weird, guys? I'm yeah, sorry. I'm, I'm not sorry, but I'm yeah. not sorry at all. Actually, <laughs> they were very delicious beers. And the Both horseradish, uh, I will say uh, the wasabi, yeah, it's horseradish because we didn't use real wasabi. Uh, that was really good in the light proportions that we used it in. Both of our beers, you could taste it in the background. It is super aggressive. I don't recommend it for many, many beers at all. In fact, there's probably like five beers out there that it'd work yeah but there is a way to make it work we did it twice 
Yes, and they were both actually really good. Yeah. The one thing that was kind of maybe a little bit off was salinity could have been tempered a little bit, but other than yeah. that, I mean, it was, it was good. And Well, in years it was really nice, and mine it was a little bit off. I made a beer to guard with it, and it was a little bit too salty mm -hmm. for a beer to guard. The fruitiness was spot on, and it was, uh, actually the wasabi in there, that background of heat. I yeah, also actually, supplemented yeah. it with chili, but it, it was really nice. Out, yeah. He made basically a ghost of style, and it was beautiful. Yeah. It, was, it was great. Um, Patrick Sandy, what about ruby cocoa beans and rose chocolate? Rose chocolate? Rose chocolate? Not familiar with those. All right. Where, where are you reading that one? Patrick Sandy, what about ruby cocoa beans and rose chocolate? That could be really – I mean, I don't know what ruby cocoa beans is. Rose chocolate, I'm uh, I'm going with rose chocolate to be rose-infused chocolate, and I'm enjoying that idea because actually coming up, as soon as we pump out bread beer and uh, Reese's Puff, we are going to be doing a new wit beer that's mm -hmm. extremely floral with rose hips, elderflowers, and chamomile. Yeah. So I enjoy the idea of having a rose-flavored <clears throat> chocolate in there. If you're meaning rose chocolate as like a red – rose colored chocolate i think that's probably just like dyed white chocolate like red red velvet cake chocolate oh red no because no, red velvet cake is just chocolate that's red huh i love red velvet absolutely love this is getting past velvet. my culinary knowledge so yeah i don't know ballast point makes a red velvet beer that is incredible do you think you can go into a stout or porter horseradish into a stout or porter stout probably more than a porter yeah yes i do think it can I think you might have to go very umame with it, and I think it would be amazing, actually. If you get a really high umame kick out of your stout. A little bit of black malt, a little bit of, what else would it need? does it need in there? There's something like, else that it needs. It needs some chilies, like Thai oh, chili. Oh, no, 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 I got it. Oyster stout. Oyster stout, oh, no, yeah. No, a no, touch no. of horseradish in an oyster stout. I think you're on to something. I'm still, I'm still adding Thai chilies in my brain. No, I, I, I think that could also help. I think if you yeah. make a chili one, that could also help. Red Robin did hop dusted fries. Not great. Yeah. Uh, but it's also Red Robin, so is anything great? Uh, oh, I, I just. how cheap the burgers are. <laughs> that's, that's. Red that's, Robin. Yuck. I mean, you know. I, I, I Fun fact Washington joking. is perfect for wasabi, but it takes two years and continued running water. Salties. Salties Creek. That never dries. There we go. Should yeah. we go plant some wasabi out there? We should find a, if we did, wasabi, if we were the first people, that's so, I have a lot of like random business ideas that roll through my brain. Wasabi farm would probably make us money here. Mushrooms, obviously, you know how much I've talked about mushrooms. Yeah. Growing mushrooms. Who wants to come work for me and come be a mushroom farmer? Uh, like a, a culinary mushroom farmer. Yeah. Tanner from Lumberbeard. Yeah, but he doesn't want to work for me, probably. I don't know, maybe he does. I mean, they can probably He wants to build his own mushroom farm. That's true. All right. So what are we talking about? Oh, let's talk flavor about flavor extracts. extracts for chocolates. There's a couple different ways to do chocolate flavor extracts when adding chocolate to beer. Uh, that, uh, that Dutch cocoa is actually one of them that we were talking about. Yeah, That's that a good would, flavor extract. Yeah, fit that category really well. Um, Benilla does a really awesome job of having actual uh, chocolate extracts that are just chocolate. That all it is is chocolate. It tastes like chocolate, soluble, ready to go. Um, it's a really good way to do it. All right, Pamela, 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 if you make that beer – and you do not send it to us, I will be sad. I will shed two tears. And you don't want to see Tim shedding two tears. No. It's not, it's not a pretty sight. Because when Tim uh, sheds We will put Sarah tears. McLaughlin in the back. In the arms of an, an angel. angel. All I'm going to say is if anyone sends Red Velvet cake... Beer, reveal, beer. Cole, Cole, if you are watching for uh, the next treat that your wife brings, please, I will. I, red velvet cook, cookies. Oh, my God. A red velvet anything. The only thing that I don't like about I'm going to actually confess this. The only thing that I don't like about red velvet is the world's obsession for putting cream cheese frosting on it. I personally am against cream cheese frosting. If I want cheese, it's not in my goddamn frosting. Also, cream cheese frosting is better if you use mascarpone instead of cream cheese. That's my high horse. I'll get off of it now. And I don't <laughs> care if you send me anything with red velvet, cream cheese frosting or not. It's going in my face hole. But Pamela, please send us that beer if you make no it. No red dye for me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, you, traditionally, you are supposed to use cherry juice to make red velvet cake. Mm -hmm. Red velvet cake has been around longer than red dye has. I know, but... But I have red to. number 40 is... 
the easy way to do it now. You yeah, should, beets. It, beets is a great way to do it too. If you do a red velvet cake with red dye in it, label it so we don't kill Matt. Yeah, Matt's allergic to red 40, so please do that and so we don't kill Matt. Anyway, flavor extracts. Getting back on the flavor <laughs> extracts. A flavor extract that I also really love to use is a uh, flavor syrup. It's a simple syrup from a company called 1882. It's a brownie one. It does have a little bit of nuttiness that goes along with it because it's walnut brownies, but I, I love that flavoring. It boosts beautiful chocolate flavor coming out of everything. Yeah, and it's a really good way to add chocolate flavor to, or to build on the flavor that might already naturally be in there. So let's say you use chocolate malt, let's say you use natural cocoa. Those don't translate to people's brains as chocolate flavor necessarily but a little bit of an actual chocolate flavoring that comes from uh, the, uh, the 1882 uh, brownie syrup. Um, even if it's just a little bit, not enough to like taste like the 1882 syrup, but enough to have it in the beer, it pushes forward all the other chocolate flavors that you have in the beer and just turns them all into a great chocolate experience. Mm -hmm. It's also a really good way, especially in something <clears throat> like white stout, to introduce that flavor with minimal color impact. Uh, it is brown. It is very dark, so you will have to be careful with it, just with the Dutch cocoa. Dutch cocoa is way stronger on that, uh, but it's also not quite as sweet. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Patrick Sandy, ruby cocoa beans are normally are normal beans processed in a different way, so they add to natural fruity flavor. So I'm guessing it's kind of like white coffee. So Warren, if you are watching this, then you need to get us some ruby cocoa beans. Warren, and figure out how to roast them to yeah. the right rubiness. Yeah. Um, Pamela, why not use the grains for color? Uh, and I'm assuming you're talking about your red velvet uh, stout right now. The deal about using the grains for color probably in Jason Grenat, thank velvet. you so much for watching, and thank you for the super chat. One, two, three, four. Woo! Uh, the deal about that is to achieve that color through grains, you're also adopting the flavor of those grains. And then uh, you just have to do that in the right way. Yeah, 100% you could do it, but if you make a delicious white stout, chocolate white stout, and then just use a little bit of the red beets to color it red, that might be an easier way to figure it out than trying to use, oh, so much of Munich and so much of Red X, but I need to cancel out the fruity flavors of those to get the chocolate flavor Unless type of thing. It, it, like cherry. Unless you're going for some of those fruity cherry flavors. Yeah, that actually could be really good with some of those fruity cherry flavors, though, if you're going the actual, like, old school way of making red velvet, which I'll also appreciate. Please, somebody send me something red velvet. <laughs> that is what these Pop-Tarts are. Red velvet. No, I, they're Boston cream. Never mind. I ate all my red velvet. Damn it! <laughs> uh, Reverend KY, yes, please. I'm harvesting turkey tail and putting them in cider. Cancer fighting yum. Sweet. Reverend, are you saying you want to be our mushroom farmer? Yeah, I think let's that's make it, what he's saying. Let's make it happen. Patrick Sandy, you are right. The first uh, red velvet cake did use beetroot. That is right. I forgot that. I knew that at one time. I feel like you guys uh, you guys know more about cooking stuff than I do. Yeah. Uh, ooh, there's a farm north of Seattle that sold wa wasabi starts. So we just need to go up there, get some, just plant them <laughs> straight through this cell tease. And then our neighborhood's going to be like, why are you guys playing around in the creek? And we're going to be like, wasabi. Mm, wasabi. What's up, e? <laughs> And they're going to be like, all right, fine. The weird kids are playing in the stream again, and we're going to be like millionaires harvesting what's up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Our <laughs> housing <laughs> development stream. Weird kids in the neighborhood. I mean, yeah, that, that's true. Yeah. And now we live yeah. in the same-ish neighborhood, so. Yeah, right there. Also, uh, talking about kids in the neighborhood, I'm going to take the time because she's probably waiting for it and say, Happy Easter, Noel. Happy Easter. Hi, Noel. Happy Easter, Noel. She she got up before I left and got her Easter basket. So my kids got up at like fun. I'm not gonna finish this because I want to save some for you guys. Uh, my kids no, got no, up at like 5:30. We still have a uh, dragon's milk. Oh, nice, dragon's milk. Yeah, 5:30. Uh, Kieran. So Kieran came up while the Easter bunny was hiding eggs, and so it was a little shuffling, you know, match to make him not see the Easter bunny. bunny. Uh, my wife and I did ours last night. I don't know, maybe you 12. Mean, you, did, you did your what? Um, eggs. You, uh, and you, then you we went outside and uh, the head of Easter eggs. <laughs> um, but, oh, P.O. Box. Okay, so if you go, if you go on to uh, our website, our address is right on our website, on our Facebook. I will also be posting it here in about 30 seconds. Matt's yeah. got us covered. By the way, Matt's the responsible one here. So Very anytime you... Barely. <laughs> you, get that, you, you are the responsible one here. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
Yeah, anytime you want to make sure anything like actually gets to us, ask our moderator Matt or send it into the Discord and Matt will take care of it. Uh, we are drinking Dragon's Milk, uh, chocolate cherry Dragon's Milk to be specific, bottled in uh, 2018. So it's a nice well-aged one. I don't know how well uh, Dragon's Milk ages, but it should age, right? Yes. What I, what I just uh, sipped from my, my rinse glass tasted pretty dang good. The first time I had this, I personally thought it was way too sweet. And so I'm actually very excited to see <clears throat> what it is. Uh, not so sweet. Because I love Dragon's Milk. And coincidentally, URM right next to us sells a shit ton of Dragon's Milk. And that <laughs> is a great beer for being as cheap as it is. All right. Mmm. The chocolate on is nice and subdued. It's got, you can tell it had at one point, it had a high hop quality. So one of the weird things about chocolate beers when you're making them to a beer style, like a stout, which is normally a high hopped beer style, um, the hops can be really, really appropriate when the beer is fresh, but sometimes as the hops age, it ends up being a weird disjointedness. And so you get mm. like um, that aged hop character, even though the IBUs and the hop profile is coming down, there's an aged hop character on top of the chocolateness and the raspberry in this case. And it, 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 it's a different flavor, cherry in this case. Um, and it's, it's a different flavor. I don't say it's, I'm not gonna say it's bad, but it's not what I would expect or necessarily want. I'm going to say this is way better than when I had it fresh. It's really I good really beer. I really enjoy this a lot. Well, when I had it fresh, it was the little disjointed. It was super sweet, and it was almost cough syrupy. Cherry is so hard to do in beer. Yeah. Even if you do real fresh cherries, cough syrup is a half a cherry away. It is not at all easy to do in any beer. This is like, this is cherry cake. This is cherry chocolate cake. Like, I feel like I am drinking chocolate cake with, like, a good cherry jam in the middle. The cherry is really good. I think the chocolate flavor and aroma both come through really well. The roast notes are still prominent in there, mm -hmm. but m m smooth and mellowed. There's also just beer flavor. It, the, that's, that's my one thing is just a little bit of it. beer flavor. Mm -hmm. There's a, 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 yeah, It's a little old. I would say probably last year. Maybe the year before was the right time to drink it. Nine out of ten things on this are, I think, are pretty pretty perfect. Perfect, yeah. Um, it's just that one thing that's – it's not even a bad thing. It's just like that one thing that I'm like, ah, oh, you know, I notice it. Yeah. It's, also, everyone's got their own palate, so drink what you like. Exactly. Uh, I enjoy this way better than when I had it fresh. When I had it fresh, it was very disjointed. All the I age quality is all got better. better, better beer. Yeah aged i think it aged too long should have drank it a little bit sooner it could have been the way that i aged it i do only cellar mine i don't refrigerate them uh mainly because most of my aged beers are sours and mixed firms so i want them to go i think cellaring was the right way well, on this one but i think i mean everything the aged characters taste perfect there's a little bit of oxidative quality mm. like a touch of like sharing out but it's just a touch too old last yeah. year would have been would have been better right in that sweet spot all right uh hendrick Potgeiter, can, I, sh can I ship you a couple of my beers or are there some U.S. laws I need to comply with first? I'm shipping from South Africa. Oh, fuck Definitely yes, do it. Can. 100% you can, um, even if there are laws. I don't care. Do it. Uh, so I don't know what it is actually cross, uh, crossing international lines on that. Uh, for U.S. laws, you just actually have to comply with whatever shipping company you're shipping with. So I suggest using something like... UPS, they're almost always the easiest one to deal with, or FedEx. Those, if you declare that it's alcohol and they say you can ship it, it's on them to worry about the international shipping laws for it, and they probably have it streamlined through. I was gonna say, I've seen live yeast samples be sent. It's a little bit different with alcohol, but that's also a living... Uh, uh, organism, but it's uh, like a crop. It's an uh, agricultural product, too. So that goes through different laws. But that's also harsher laws. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, uh, use, uh, use UPS. And if they say you can send it through, send it through. I think you should have no problem with that. Um, and if you want it drank on the live stream, label it Matthew. Yes. So yes. They will drink it without it. Yes. yes. Um, if it's here and it doesn't say not to drink it, it'll get drank. It'll get drank. Except you guys have been doing a good job not drinking beer fridge. Yeah, well, 
You That's because I got yelled at a bunch of times. You only got yelled at for drinking the specific ones I looked at you and said, Chumbly wants to taste this his beer with these beers. You expect me to remember like one thing that you say? No. <laughs> but I expect you to at least look at it and go, why are all these beers set different? And, oh, yeah, they're with Chumbly's beer. That takes too, yeah, it's too much thinking. It. What's in the box? <laughs> Uh, how many pounds of cherries would you add to five gallons of beer? Rule of thumb is one pound per gallon. I'd probably uh, go a little less than that personally. Yeah, start out with less <clears throat> on cherries. And then it depends on what type of cherries you're adding because they're going to be all, all over the place. Uh, adding a Rainier cherry, you can go more aggressive with that because they're so light and delicate. Adding a Bing cherry, I would probably go lower because that can go soft or uh Sorry, cough syrup very quickly. Adding something like a uh, Montmorency or a Van Lambert, you can probably actually go a little more aggressive because those are tart. Pie cherry, you can go a little more aggressive. Uh, Scarbix, if you have them, please send them to me and send me a seed so I can definitely grow not grow my own here. We're just going to George Washington this. Exactly. Uh, Johnny Appleseed? Yeah, that thing. Johnny the Appleseed. opposite of George Washington. He's yeah, tra- yeah. He chopped down a cherry tree or something like that. I don't know. It, Johnny Appleseed. All right, tangent time. Tangent time. Count this as your Tim, or, uh, stand soapbox for the day on your card. Johnny Appleseed. Johnny Appleseed was a real dude. He legitimately went around the United States planting apple orchards around places for free. Uh, he actually did a lot of work to preserve some really cool uh, heirloom apple styles. And you can go into the cider world and research this. He did not do it for food, apple pies to eat, or things like that. Johnny Appleseed was going around to plant apple orchards to make cider. Nice. We're going to, down the road, have someone to talk about cider on the live stream. Yeah. We just need to figure out the date. Nice. Get over here, Trent. Yep, Trent. Mm Whoa! Uh, but that's a real thing. Johnny Appleseed was going around to plant apples to make orchards to make cider. Because, a fun fact... Hops are not super fond of the East Coast, uh, as well as a lot of the barley crops to make beer are not super fond of the moisture over there. So it was a lot harder to make beer on the East Coast than it is, Mm -hmm. you know, in other places in Europe. But apples grew really well, and apple booze is really tasty. All right, that's my soapbox for the day. Uh, Let's talk a little bit about how you want to add cherries. Step one, de-pit. Step two, save the pit. And also use that, but in a different variation. We'll talk about that in a second. Step three, freeze. Yes. Uh, the freezing of the cherries, the freezing of any fruit will help burst the <clears throat> cell walls. Uh, bursting the cell walls will really help the beer and the juice from that pass through the cell walls without degrading the cell. Oh, I died. Uh, without <laughs> degrading the cell to the point that you're extracting chlorophylls, you're extracting harsh tannins and things like that from the fruit flesh. Yeah, uh, I like to puree after, although it's not a necessary step because freezing will get rid of most of the bacteria. However, if there are specks of random shit stuff, sorry, um, uh, from your freezer that are getting on your cherries, then definitely go ahead and toss them in something and pasteurize them. Uh, and then, yeah, just uh, add them right into your, into your stuff. Uh, add them into the secondary. I like adding them into the secondary, uh, usually towards the tail end of fermentation. I like the yeast to still be up and active while fermenting, uh, but not very active. You want a nice soft <clears throat> ferment. You don't want to blow off the volatile aromatics, but you do want to get rid of most of the residual sugars. The pits. Let's come back to that. Yeah. So why you keep the pits there's a lot of people out there in the world are gonna be like oh no you can't put the pits in there there's cyanide you're gonna die you're right there is actual cyanide in cherry pits yeah so eat like you know 400 to 500 number and you might get slightly sick that is also true you would kill yourself by eating too many cherry pits before you got enough cyanide to actually do it plus the fact the cherry pit needs to be crushed up for the cyanide to be extracted. Also the fact that it's not actual cyanide and it needs an enzyme to be broken down, the chemical to be broken down into cyanide. So you're pretty damn safe. Now, that being said, what does the cherry pits give you? Amaretto flavor, like really, really nice amaretto Amaretto flavor. flavor. 
Cherries and almonds are very, very close to each other. And if you find in your beer, if you don't <clears throat> have enough cherry flavor, instead of risking the cough syrup, see if you can add some amaretto or some almond flavor to help boost the cherry flavor. Disarono is the expensive version of amaretto that you've probably seen in stores. Um, although there are better amarettos that are cheaper than Disarono. There is, but oh, make a sour out of it. It's so delicious. Oh, yes. I'm, oh my God. That peach is... Disarono or peach amaretto sour. Mmm. Let's feel Luxardo's in there. Yeah. And, uh, oh, that'd be a cool garnish. Like have a proper cocktail cherry in a beer. Yeah. That'd be a really cool garnish. That'd be amazing. Anyway, uh, so that is going to add some <clears throat> almond, some amaretto flavor into there. It's going to add some soft, woody flavors into there as well. And when you're doing the pits, just throw them right into that tail end of fermentation. Let the yeast get in there. Let the yeast extract some of those soft, woody flavors out of the pits into your beer. And you're going to get a bigger, rounder, tastier cherry flavor out of it. And it's going to be a far less risk of going into cough syrup. Ribbon KY says his cherry almond lemon zest cider is the best selling one at his cidery. Fuck. Reverend, why haven't you sent us some? That's a good cherry, question. Cherry almond lemon that I'm making that. That is gonna be my next cider is gonna be cherry blossom almond. Or gate, probably, but Yo, know, have you the seen difference? the videos I'm making like a proper or 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 no, sure or je or je sure. Or je also I'll just call it or yeah, I call it or just like just like how I call it quite quick. Yeah, uh, it says it close enough. No, I haven't, but I want to see it and I want to make it. Also, Reverend, are you going to Washington Brewers Fest in June in Redmond? Because if you are, we should totally meet up. <laughs> uh, oh, God damn it. Yeah. It sounds like you guys have enough horrors. Well, I mean, you could go under the genus name and just get a free ticket in. No, hey, Matt is definitely not just using it for a free ticket. No, no, no. I, me and Sky talked about it. I'll help set up. There you go. So, yeah, if you – also, you guys need more swag before that event. Yeah, we do. To, so I could wear, like, a, like this type of sweatshirt. Yeah, we yeah. do. Uh, Actually, what might not be bad for that type of sweatshirt is just to run, like, the whole helix down one side. Oh, really yeah. Cool so, so uh, Chris Kilduff, you need to talk to Shay. Yeah. Matt, you need to talk to Chris Kilduff. Don't know Chris. You know, well, you should know Chris. You should, you should get to I know, know Chris. His younger brother, if I don't know Chris. I'll introduce you to Chris. All right, fine. Actually, if I have time next I know week, Ethan, if I have, oh yeah, there you go. Yeah, I'll just, I'll talk to Ethan. Yeah, yeah. All right, Ethan, Shay, Matt, Triangle, Mix, Merch. It'll make it happen. Because yeah, you guys need for your reps, you need some more. Yeah. Well, also, I'll be in Mexico next week, so it's gonna happen later if I have to do it. Yeah, I will be in uh, Disney World during that time. So. And also. Because I typed it in the chat, but I'm going to say it. If you guys have live stream ideas, send them my way. Yeah, Matt, on the Discord. And I definitely think we need we can do graph. We just need to figure out how we're going to do it. Yeah. But we're going to do a cider episode, and then we'll figure out graph later. I'm, I'm, really, I'm, really, good at pie, I'm really good at uh, pie charts, but I'll have to probably learn a little bit more about graphs. Um, this is, by the way, this is the beer from last week. The OG IPA from Garland Brewers. Yeah, it's a really good IPA. I was stoked to have that on tap, actually. Good job, Adam. No live stream. Uh, no, well, you know we, oh, no, there's a live stream next week. There's a live stream next week. There's a live stream next week. I, and I, I, might have a, I might have a surprise for us. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I, you know, I'm going to actually say I was really impressed with all the beers that Adam uh, brought. I, he's getting back into brewing his beers and getting back into making what he wants. That's yeah. something in the professional industry we haven't really talked about too much is that when you get into it, a lot of time you are not making the beer that you want. You are yeah. not making your beer. You're making the brewery's beer, which can be unfortunate. And, you know, I've said it before. Some of the iron goat sours that I tasted were not Adam's quality. And I was... It, it was sad, dude. Yeah. You go, I know you, and I Tasting know you can make and, such yeah. good beer, and this just isn't quite it. And he's making that beer at Garland Brew Works, so I'm really happy to see that. Yeah. and Hendrick, Fantastic beer. I was going to say, Hendrick, to answer your question, even though I typed it in the chat, just put attention, Matthew W. Yep. Because that will get it to me. And then I won't randomly see it late at night when I'm drunk and then drink it. Mm. Well, 
was gonna say we're, I'm making a box for the beer fridge that's just gonna be labeled live stream box. Yeah. So well, yeah. We don't touch it. That's a smart move. That's a smart move. Um, all right. What else? What are the questions we got? Uh, we are. I would say we're past opening time, but we're not going to open today. So uh, my wife said I didn't have to be home until eleven. So technically, I got till eleven. I was going to be here long enough to help open up, get it solidified, and yeah. stuff. But so yeah, now we got till eleven. Yeah. What do we want to ask? What do we want to know? I don't have. I can also crack open some of the other random beers that we have in the beer fridge. I need to finish a couple here first. I know, you're the slowest beer drinker. I have not been drinking for a while because I have not been feeling well. I did go out yesterday and have a few beers. I visited Damien at No Drought. That was actually a pretty cool experience. Nice. That was a fun little tap room to go into. He's got uh, some pretty good stuff going on. I did not realize he was that close to the school. Yeah, like he's right there. Right. And he doesn't have a teacher. All right, Damon, I'm calling you out again. We did it there, but we're doing it here again. Dude, you need to pick up those teachers. You need to have a teacher day, a teacher appreciation day. Tuesday. Capture, Tuesday. capture. Well, they're doing trivia on Tuesday. I want to say teacher, teachers or people that work in the school district are probably like a third of our beer drinking customers. It, I mean, yeah. It's not, I mean, it's, it's, that's not an exaggeration. Like, there's a lot, lot of teachers, like elementary teachers, high school teachers, a lot of people. One of the schools, and we'll keep it civil for online wor uh, world, one of the schools, their PTO meetings actually started to happen here before shutdown, started to happen <clears> here <throat> all mm -hmm. the time. And that's a deal is because teachers need some time to relax. You don't like dealing with your own kid. Imagine dealing with 26 of not your own kid every day yeah and then going home to deal with your own kid yeah those guys need some breaks now granted say, i'm not I, saying every I teacher out there is good the summer and i don't want to deal with people's kids on a regular basis and i choose to make sure that they're not doing teenage stuff in a dorm hall when we get out of the summer yeah by the way emory if you are watching i know we said hi to noel emory if you're watching hi emory hi emory hey I, yeah. So uh, Damon captured them, but yeah, that was really cool. That was uh, fun. Uh, we went over to Yaya's. I that saw their new expanded place. That's awesome. Nice. I haven't, I haven't checked that out yet. Yeah. And Damon had some real. Oh man, if you guys are in the area, uh, you need to go up to No Drought, have the Berliner Weiss, and have it with the Woodruff syrup. I don't care how well you like sour beers and you think that. Nah, nah, nah. Have it with the Woodruff syrup because it's amazing. All right. I need yeah. to go to Yaya. We need to get, to get, it's why Yaya and you should have taken some pictures so we could put it on the oh Valley Cup God. Instagram. I well, took a picture say, for it, but you, yeah, I, you, you know, want me to take pictures? They open at noon today. Huh? They open at noon today. Okay. Well, I have to. Yeah, that works. Yeah. Yeah. Don't worry. I have a new phone on the way, though. I got a Google Pixel 6. Hey, that's what I got. Nice. It takes really good pictures. Yeah. So it told me I could get it for like zero dollars. So yeah. I was like, ah, yeah. they always say zero dollars, but. Uh, well, no, for a trade in. Yeah, zero dollars to us. I heard teachers in the states are quite stressed nowadays, especially due to Zoom. Yeah, oh, there's man. a lot of stuff that went with uh, like both our wives are teachers. Teachers. Um, yeah, it was a lot of friends not that easy. Are teachers like mm -hmm. at different levels, like it's, and, uh, it's not an easy job. Yeah, I'm gonna. I will throw it out here. I am not defending teachers for teachers' sakes. Most teachers out there are absolutely and utterly amazing people who sacrifice so much, so much for their jobs. There are jerks in every profession, and we should never like a jerk. Yeah. But, yeah, you are right. With the Zooms, uh, trying to keep kids focused in there. And, I mean, parents so. are having a hard time with it, too. you got to find time to put your kid in front of that in your own home now. And that's not easy, but... Now this person has to control 26 kids in their own home when they're not even physically there. Yeah. It, it, man, no. I, my mm -hmm. wife's a saint. Also, nine times out of ten, by the way, when teachers or coaches, uh, I coach track and cross country, if they need something, they usually just have to buy it. By themselves. And, and we do it because, you know, we want the kids to have the best possible experience. But it's not, we're not going to get reimbursed. We don't like, we're not getting paid to do it. We just, you know, hey, by the way, we need this. Oh, we can't afford that. This says the school district that just built a, you know, $100 million school. And so they can't afford my $10 thing and I just have to buy it. Okay. Yeah. Let's get back to beer. Well, beer. No, we were on it and, you know, that's, that is a real thing <clears throat> is that the majority of the time, the people that are in the teaching jobs are there for the love of the kids. You know, that was my dad. Yeah. yeah, there there are a few who are not, and they are absolute jerks, and we should never defend them. But 
the majority of it are there for the love of the kids and you know help help them out how you can because those those people deserve it now more than we do but send us beer John Palmer said that doing a protein rest in a fully modified malt will result in a thin beer. Is that an old school way of thinking? I remember you guys saying this could be done to increase efficiency. Uh, I do a protein rest not all the time, but quite often. Um, I do just kind of build my grist around knowing that I'm going to do a protein rest, though. So John Palmer. What about it? Is this John Palmer? Uh, no, this is uh, from F- Funky Brewer oh. mentioning John Palmer. Okay. I was like, is John Palmer on here? Because <laughs> I uh, – thank you. Uh, John, I, I mean, I would believe most of the stuff that John Palmer does. I enjoy John Palmer's book, the way he presents everything. And yeah, uh, it's I, out of brew. It, yeah, every single beer that we do here goes through a protein rest and I add at least beta gluconase in it. So yeah, I'm getting rid of all those proteins that are bodybuilders and beers. But like Peter said, what we do instead is build our grist around that to produce other bodybuilders in there so we can get rid of all of that stuff that could potentially give you bad stuff in the end. Yeah, in our mind, we're eliminating variables. And so we just, mm-hmm. by knowing that we're always going to do a rest similar to that, we're always going to have, specifically, we're going to have, you know, OptiMash and ViscoBuster in our, in our mash. Um, we are doing something that if you just did a single infusion, um, mash with a two row malt, then yeah, it'd probably be thin, uh, which is fine for some styles, not fine for other styles, whatever. But we know what we're going into and we think it's a better way to brew overall. And we just build our recipes around that. It's a different technique um, than what you do when you start out brewing. Um, but we recommend it and we recommend learning how to build around it, like adding some set of wheat or oats into almost every beer. Uh, or adding in extra boil for some Maillard reaction mm-hmm. uh, in there and start building a body that way or building body through yeast production uh, in specific yeast, uh, things like that. So that's what we choose to do uh, for beginner brewers. That's not what we tell them to do. We tell them to just get their system down. And once they start getting their system down, these are things we can start playing with. Uh, but that's what we like. I and mean, we think it makes really good beer. Yeah. Uh, Hendrik Potgatter, will you guys do Will It Beer again? We hope so. Um, me if, and Warren want to be on one of the episodes. Uh, me and Warren have already talked about it. Yeah, okay. uh, that'd be awesome. It's going to take so it's going to take getting our production team. One of the reasons we were able to do that is because Ryan is actually very uh, – our old media guy is actually very, very succinct and good at putting productions together quickly and efficiently. Um, our current guys are really, really good, uh, but also have a lot on their plate and aren't good at that same kind of organization. So not to put it all on them, although, you know, Ryan was awesome at what he does. Yeah. Not taking anything away from him at the time that we were doing a lot of the will at brews was also during shutdown and limited capacity times. And I will say there were, I would brew once every other week, maybe once every couple of weeks on yeah. it and now i'm struggling to keep up and it's like two brews a week yeah i have to constantly i have to probably have to buy one or two kegs of beer a week just to make sure that we can keep up on what we're selling yeah so there uh, there's a lot more into it we have we're a lot busier at this time which is good because that means we can start to bring people in and start to really flesh things out so we can put better production deals and uh, better organization into the well it brews but at the moment uh, at the moment yes they're gonna come back um and part of that's also because we're gonna have ryan back yeah. not, not back with us but back with you a know. side company that we're doing for media production um uh but yeah that'll be part of it uh, Pamela Hakla, how many options uh, are there for flavoring a hard seltzer? My box for the Women's International Beer Summit came in with a hard seltzer yeast slash nutrient packet. Mm. A lot of options. Anything. Yeah. Literally, literally anything. Yeah. Do you want to make a, your hard seltzer taste like root beer? There's a good flavoring. Uh, tamarindo. Actually, I really suggest tamarindo. You just made a tamarind soda. Yeah. And it is phenomenally amazing for that to be alcoholic would be stupid incredible one of the things that we have found here that actually is amazing for seltzers it keeps the sugar content down on it um, as well as adding mass amounts of flavors is doing a lemonade style and really adding in some good lemon juice to whatever flavoring you're going with the lemon juice the acids really help carry the uh, flavors forward as well as adding body to it without 
adding a whole bunch of sugar. Patrick Sandy, my local brewery, makes a plain hard seltzer and flavors it with different Monin syrups in the glass. It's not a bad way to go. Monin, Monin does a really good job. be getting a seltzer, Alex and Tim combo live stream at some point in time in the future. That'd be fun. Set it up. Yeah, that'd be all right. Uh, yeah, that's I, you know, that's not that different from what we do. I make a five barrel batch of seltzer and then I use a lot of the time moaning syrups to just flavor per cake. Mm-hmm. Um, the deal about flavoring it per glass, you would have to train your audience or have the crowd enough to accept that first. Mm-hmm. It's not a packaged product. There, I mm. could see that being a problem in a lot of areas, just being like, well, wait a minute. You're just adding in moaning syrup to my glass? That's not authentic. Yeah, it, 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 it's and weird it's, because in the coffee industry, obviously it's very blatant and apparent what they're doing. In the beer industry, they're, the mystery still needs to be there for a lot of people to accept it, and I don't know why that is, but... It's like the same reason that brewers are afraid of of blending beers. Are you afraid of having a beer that tastes better? Like, what's your problem with having something that tastes amazing to somebody? And then they love you for that. Yeah. I don't know how many times people come back to us just because we're willing to blend beers and give them something, a flavor they've never had before. Yeah. There's a certain group of uh, people that come back for a beer they invented which, I mean, it's our stout and coffee cold poured together. Yeah, okay. Oh, it's really good. Yeah. And it literally, they what, call it a Captain Mac or something. I don't know. Uh, Mac and Mark. Mac and Mark is what they call it. Yeah. And those are the two guys that come in and we're like, really, it's a Count Muncher. But, yeah, it's a Mac and Mark to you guys. And they absolutely love it and go nuts for it. Why do you hate your customers that much that you're not going to give them that joy? Yeah. I, like, that, that, that confuses me. That really confuses me. I don't know. Uh, that's awesome, though. I mean, I, I enjoy that. Imagine having a custom-made seltzer. Yeah, I want, uh, uh, let's see, blueberry, uh, lavender, and lime. That sounds like a great seltzer. To have a different seltzer every time you go out, that sounds awesome, man. That, that's pretty I mean, cool. We do that all the time. Like, let's say we have a seltzer that someone's like, ah, oh, it's a little bit too dry or a little bit too tart or something like that. Then we've got a sweet cider on tap. We're like, oh, let's try the same seltzer, same base flavor. But we'll add a little bit of a hard cider we've got on, on tap. It's got some sweetness to it. And so you're going to get a little bit more of a sweet profile. Like, there's nothing wrong with that. You just you got to cater to different people's palates. It's amazing. I think that might be part of our background coming from bartending, too. It's just the joy of finding a flavor for somebody that they enjoy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Can you use baker's chocolate slash regular chocolate in beers? Uh, yes, you can. There's different ways to do it. The one thing that you're avoiding, and we talked about this a little bit earlier, but you're avoiding all the oils that naturally go into chocolate. And so ways to do it, um, tincture or grains. Um, tincture is kind of the easiest way to separate out fats, but um, using your grains or actually chocolate in your mash works too. Yeah, uh, that is one of the hard parts. It's one of the reasons that we didn't mention actually using chocolate <laughs> excuse me, chocolate bars or any kind of solidified chocolate. I talked about it a little bit with, with the Abuelita, the Abuelita and yeah. stuff. The pucks are really nice. I used to, um, who's the Seattle one? It's not Todd's. Uh, there's a Seattle uh, chocolate company that is amazing. And they're actually right by Fremont Brewing Company down the street from the Brewer's Cafe. If you haven't been to the Brewer's Cafe in the Seattle, Fremont area, go because that is stupid good. It's pronounced Cafe. Brewer's yeah. Cafe. Brewer's Cafe. Brewer's Cafe. Yep. You got to say it Belgian. How do that? Oh, it's a Belgian accent. I can't do that. Brewer's Cafe. I uh, get a little bit into the French and it's a Brewer's Cafe. Uh, but the only problem with the French accent is uh, every <laughs> once in a while you see something that uh, does not sound like a shit. Anyway, uh, I think that was pretty good. I mean, I dropped into that pretty good. Yeah, right? they, they, yeah I, I, I kind of nailed that one. Like, uh, way better than I can uh, do. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, it is just the French in me. But you know, <laughs> it'll be the French in my wife later. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. Anyway. You know, baguette. A uh, poquito baguette. Uh, hey, you know, <laughs> the baguette is still satisfying hundreds of women every day. <laughs> yeah, all right. Well, we're, we're moving on from that one. Uh, so, yeah, if you're using solid chocolate bars, just keep in mind when you're using chocolate bars, pressed chocolate, things like that. Uh, oh, anyway, what I was saying, the chocolate company that's in Seattle over there in Fremont is incredible. They used to make some good discs that I used to use all the time. But again, what I've found is there's 
there's wax in the bars there's a lot of fats and oils in the bars even the big baking chocolate bars to solidify them together like that there's a lot of fats and oils and sometimes waxes I so say, I, i've noticed when i was in canada the chocolate bars are very different and a lot more like they actually have to keep them at a colder temperature to keep them together yeah because it melts at 86 degrees it's part of the reason that there's wax in a lot of chocolate bars which there's absolutely nothing wrong with it it doesn't really change the flavor the texture or anything like that but to keep them, so they melt at 86. To keep it solid, you have to do things like that. Also, American chocolate is generally soured. Mm -hmm. I did find this out, which is a pretty cool idea. And honestly, I like it because I like sour things. But it, that's a cool idea to think about sour and chocolate going together. And they go oh. together really well. Do I need to add that to the Tim's beer idea sheet? Uh, no, I've already had them. They come from Cascade Brewing Company, and they're incredible. I actually had one from the brewery. The brewery uh, many oh. years ago had a problem with uh, some of their chocolate stout souring, some cross-contamination. My brother-in-law, Jeremy, bought a few of them, and I loved them. They were amazing. I, I mean, you know, it wasn't what the brewery intended to give to you, and I feel unfortunate. it's unfortunate for them that that happened, but those were incredible beers. I enjoy the, the shit out of them, really. All right. I'm digressing. Any other questions from the chat? We getting anything more? I mean, what else are we talking about here? I have to 11 o'clock. What time is it? We got a half an hour. I don't have to be home. Well, you got to tear down, though. Although my wife is probably watching that going, that asshole. <laughs> if he knows he should be home now. All uh, right. Well, let's start working on, on closing out. And then if we get any other questions popping up, then we will answer those as they come up. But... Check out our Amazon wish list. Uh, we've got some cool videos coming out just because people have already done that. We're willing to do things for you if you buy something from our Amazon wish list. Uh, and we need everything on that list very, very desperately or uh, else we won't be able to make beer. There is actually a lot of true things onto that. I'm going to push the electric skateboard again because this week my car went down again and I was left without transportation again. And that could have been extremely useful. I'm yeah. And with gas here. prices right now, <laughs> that could save money for us. That saves money for you on stuff that we can do. Um, the also, chair. the chair. The chair, the uh, chair yeah, you, for Matt. You, you, uh, well, for everybody, because everyone who's a computer can use a good chair. Use the chair. Uh, oh my God, Patrick Sandy, you blend sours with Young's Double Chocolate. If you have not had Young's Double Chocolate Stout, you should because it's incredible. That is an amazing, amazing idea, Patrick Sandy. Paul Rip Stylo, I missed the first part of this uh, show. What's a quick grain bill for a white stout recipe? We start with Heidelberg or a very, very light malt. So we add a little bit of uh, oats or, or flaked barley or something like that to build body. Um, and then a small amount of wheat and maybe even a tiny, tiny, tiny amount of acid malt, depending on your water chemistry. That was uh, grain bill. 12 pounds total is what I did, but you know, you can, you can vary that based on what you need. Reverend KY, boxers or briefs? Uh, it depends on the day. Generally, for the live stream that we have to do, or what? Uh, probably going to do boxer briefs. Uh, nothing. Yeah, nothing. Yeah, we're just going to go full, we're just, full, we're full nude. Tube socks? Full, yeah, tube, tube, socks. tube socks and boots. Tube socks say, and boots. So no, it'll boots. probably be boxer briefs. Uh, I have been an athlete for most of my... Well, I've been an athlete when I was a young kid, and then when I was out of high school. Well, no, I did some in college. I mean... I fenced against a, a Olympian, actually. So I have that to my name. So I was an athlete for a while. Uh, I enjoy some support, but also whitey tighties are just a little too tight and white. So we go, we go for some boxer briefs. I get some thigh, some some thigh rub, you know. So I need yeah. the boxer briefs too because I need the extra. You need to actually, I will agree to that. You need a little bit of length on the boxer briefs to really help with the chafing, uh, especially mm -hmm. in your pants. Uh, you know, I don't have a good thigh gap. My thighs rub together. Yeah. Like a man. Like a man. Does Irish Moss do much cool, do much, does Irish Moss do much just cooling to 90 for a quike bitch? Yes. Irish moss, so you add Irish moss 10 minutes to 15 minutes before the end of the boil, and actually all the coagulation happens there. All the dropout happens during cooling, but yeah, if you're cooling between you know 200 and 100, it'll, it'll work. It'll work. Um, Adventures in Home Brewing, uh, okay, a bit off topic, but here's the question. Looking at a maple bacon donut stout, uh, would you suggest putting the donuts in the mash? Yes. 
Um, again, oil absorption. So actually the holes of barley will help absorb some of the fats. Um, so mash and recirculation, a lot of recirculation, will actually thin out most of those fats and get clean, sugary stuff into the boil. And hopefully Pat I will have a brewery that makes a festival-winning maple bar beer on the live stream hopefully soon. Nice. Yeah, it's festival winning because it is a maple bar beer, but yeah, we're gonna I, we're gonna well, skip beyond that. It's Patrick a, Sand, it, it's a great beer, and I nice. I drank this shit out of it, but I love maple. Patrick Sandy, RHCP reference. Yes. I thought you told Jerry that sir. we're gonna close today. Yes, sir. Uh, RHCP is one of my favorite bands out there. I do have a tattoo of them. Their new album is amazing because John Frusciante is back, and oh my god. Yes, I will fangirl so hard if I get to go to one of their concerts. Tell you what, if one of you people buys me a ticket to the uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers concert instead of anything else on that list, n I mean, name your price. Um, sours and stouts, maybe shipped via Ocean Freight. Yeah, sours and stouts, anything that age well will probably be fine. Um, the heating and cooling will uh, um, the heating and cooling will age them differently. Just give him one beer. Like, we'll give Jerry a beer. It's Jerry. We'll give him a beer. Uh, yes, John. Ship your stouts and sours. Your sours actually may benefit from that because uh, the warming, the cooling, the rocking in there will kind of kick up a little bit of fermentation and deliciousness. Uh, so that, that could be something delicious. Yeah. Actually, that is one of the reasons that uh, beers like Lindemann's killed off their um, culture in their beers and sweetened their beers because they found when shipping their beers over to the United States, they got extra funky and sour. Which and is good. Americans but, didn't know. enjoy that. So they pasteurized them and sweetened them up a little bit for the ride, which I wish they wouldn't have done. But uh, you don't have to, and then you can get them awesomely delicious. Yeah, just tell, them to, get, just tell them to get better Americans. That is true. Just tell them to get better Americans. Yeah. Why don't we like things that are delicious? Well, we do. But also, like... There's a select few of us, and the rest of us are, like, good with Red Robin. We invented American cheese, which this is my soapbox for, for the day. You're no. one so Yeah, the only one, the only soapbox. The, the only one that we've <laughs> done today at all. That is plastic. That shit doesn't even burn. It doesn't melt. It just is plastic. <laughs> That's not cheese, and I'm over it. All right. What do uh, we got? Oh, very good. Um, check out Amazon wish list. Oh. All right. um, we will, we will, we will make you videos. We will come to your. If you buy something expensive enough, we'll come to your town and shoot you a wedding, or film a commercial for you, or, uh, or, or make a beer for you. I don't know. Somewhere. Well, no, that's actually something you kind of got something uh, in that too. You buy something expensive enough for us, we'll make the beer for your wedding. Yeah, we'll go there. We'll yeah, we'll bring deliver hey, it to if you. If you make it expensive enough, we'll bring the jockey box and serve it for you too. Yeah, we'll lecture everybody coming up. But we'll serve it for you. Yeah. Uh, so tag all your friends. Say, hey, by the way, if you got a, something that you can need beer for, let us know. Oh, actually, quick question. Yeah. Last, last question. Last question. Weed and beer, yay or nay. Uh, a lot of the same terpenes are in weed, uh, cannabis as well as hops. You can make it work from experiences of home brewers bringing it in as well as things I've done for myself. It is a very different flavor. You get way more plant material in it, so you need to change what beer you're doing to make it work. I would say the hemp beer that Black Label made was really, really that good. That was really good. So yeah. for flavor-wise, there's a way to do, do it. it. For effect and flavor-wise, I'm just never gonna drink that beer. Um, I, you know, I like to keep those two things separate in my mind, and uh, there's, I think there's good reasons for that. Um, if you wanna do it, it's very doable. Um, just keep in mind that uh, you're never going to get it hot enough to decarboxylate, so that's not going to work. The alcohol will work to decarboxylate, but you're not adding very much alcohol in there for a beer, so it's not going to be as effective as you think. The only way to do, yeah, the only way to like make the uh, uh, THC part actually get there is to decar decarboxylate in your oven, put that in a tincture, and then add that tincture to I've, your beer. I've gotten it to decarboxylate through dry hopping before. But it's just not, it's way less efficient than you want it to be. Um, and it's way easier to just take the two separate things and enjoy them at the same time than to make a beer out of it. But it is, it is easy to do. And if you really want to make a beer taste like any strain of weed, there are uh, companies out there like Abstracts that make uh, 
strain specific isolates of terpenes that you can just add straight into your beer and that, those are actually really good we've been using some of those terpene isolates yeah and a few of our yeah, beers yeah, they're great. are awesome so yeah separate so. your flavor and your function your functionality if you want to smoke weed and drink beer like do those two things separately and just get the same effect uh, esteban andrade z mm. even, esteban. If it's, even if it's in ecuador haha yeah why not yeah. No, I would yeah, love will, I to say. go to Ecuador. I would love There's to go. There's a number. There is. The computer that I have on that wish list, if you buy it, yeah, I'm there. There is a number for that. I would love to go to Ecuador, Guatemala. There's a lot of those places I would absolutely and utterly love to 100%. go. 100%. So and if yeah, you they... make it worth it for us, we'll do it. 100%. Um, Sean Huntley, I have a question. I recently had one of those Lagunitas infused beers. Tasted like metal and not natural. Why? Um, metal for me a lot comes from malt oxidation or an overuse of crystal malt. Yeah, I could see with some infusions that there could be something in the water that yeah. makes that happen, or there could be something in the uh, uh, the substrate of the infusion. What you're infusing it with could taste fine on its own but when it's uh, and he was talking about water but it could be actually like the stabilizing agent that when it combines with alcohol when it combines with hops when it combines to with make malts, it soluble to make it could make the metallic taste going on in there uh, there's a lot of different things that could be going on i would say that you know it especially <laughs> knowing what lagunitas does it was probably done a lot more for effect than thinking out hey is this going to taste good Putting more American cheese is cheese food. It's what you feed cheese. I can go with that. <laughs> like, that, that was well written. That was well written, but I'm still going for it. American, the only thing that American cheese is good for is throwing at people. Which is also very fun. Yeah, that, I mean, keep mm -hmm. making American cheese so we can throw it at babies and dogs and other people and get it to stick. Uh, but <laughs> other than that, don't eat that. That is... That is Patrick Sandy, is that one ticket or two? Yes. Depends on the item you make, but two would be preferable. Yeah. Three. Three? Four, we'll get Logan in there. Yeah. He'll teach you how yeah. to, well, I mean, he'll, he'll come probably he'll, do the actual come, yeah. work. That's the important part. We do need somebody to do that. That's why it's three, because of me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, let's be honest. There's... Let's be honest. Also, uh, Young Young, uh, I think uh, you should you should buy something enough for us to come over to. I don't remember where you are, but he's in Japan. Yeah. Oh. Yes. Yes. Well, I, there's a whole bunch in uh, Asia Asia Minor that I would love to go visit. Japan is one of those that's on the top of my list. That place, I mean, everything I see is so amazing and at the same time so nutty. I want to go see a snowfall at a temple in Japan, just all by myself, watching the snow, fall in the woods. Yeah, It'll while, be amazing. Yeah, while meditating. While drinking. Yes. Uh, <laughs> little, uh, 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 holy sake. Yeah. Holy yeah. sake. Uh, <laughs> but at the same time, I also... Oh, oh Korea. South. Oh, Korea, Korea. South Korea? Korea. Yeah, I'm oh, fine Korea. with that, too. I, uh, yes. Are you kidding? Korean barbecue? I get to go and eat some wonderful... <laughs> kimchi kimchi cucumber salad i get to eat some bulgogi daijabo oh, daijabo oh, yeah. i'm sorry i used to I, work at a korean restaurant i, I got obsessed with bulgogi i love I, some good some good some good bibimbap mm. bibimbap bibimbap i made a good bibimbap uh, yeah and, and steph we are in talks to do a nerdy podcast about that i don't not a live stream uh, yeah, so yeah, Steph, uh, from what I hear, we have to do a uh, live brew day in our underwear. So yeah, that's going to happen. That's going to happen. That's, that's, well, not even, not even paying <laughs> attention. Uh, that's going to happen <laughs> one of these days. Uh, very well, soon, when um, I get back. And maybe yeah. at, maybe at, uh, No Drought? No Drought? Or I mean, either at, either that or Garland Brewers. Uh, I mean. We'll figure it out. Yeah, we'll figure it out to do it somewhere there. I was going to say, I. Well, he requested five barrels specifically, so that kind of limits gotta, us. Yeah, we got to find specifically a five barrel. So Garland Brew Works. I mean, if he's willing to open it up to or be not any size. Or well, not 20. They're, th they're three barrel. Uh, Garland Brew Works is five barrel, I thought. Garland is, but not 20 is three. The new one? The no, new one will be six when he no, gets the, down the, there. No, the brewed system is five. The uh, fermenters are 10. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, yeah, not 20? Yeah. Reese. Reese. 
<laughs> Jordan Stout, American uh, bulgogi topped with American cheese. <laughs> okay, do your closeouts and closing out the stream. Can we ban him for that? You are <laughs> gonna, you are going to like, subscribe, <laughs> comment, ring the bell, all the things. Uh, just just punch punch the punch, punch the, the like button, button in the in the shoulder. You are uh, seriously going to ruin Bulgogi with, with America. Tune in next week. I won't be here. Tim will be here. Matt Hansen, which is a really awesome dude who loves German-style beers and yeah. is amazing at making light lagers, will be here. Um, other Matt, our man on the chair, Matt, will be here as well. He, he might be here. He might be over there. I don't really know how they're going to set it up, but it's going to be a really fun time. And Matt uh, Hansen, Whistle Punk Matt, which, by the way, Whistle Punk is the brewery that we always say is the best brewery in Spokane. Yeah. We're not kidding about that. He no. makes the best beer in Spokane. We're going to be drinking it. We'll yeah. be drinking it, and he that's a, that'll be a good live stream. So tune and in next week. And that's, uh, that's coming from us. That is legitimately coming from us. We have the best beer in Spokane. Whistle Punk has the best beer. Uh, Logan Spokane. will be here next week as well. Uh, cameo, maybe. Maybe. Um, I'll see if he wants to sit down. down. Yeah. Yeah, I'll convince him into it. Uh, and thank you, Stefan Sotomayor, for buying us whatever is going to make us brew beer in our underwear. Yeah, I think that's actually that's <laughs> I, I am impressed you have your commitment, sir, and I applaud your uh, I, I applaud you for that. Plus, you have one of our favorite names on the entirety of live stream. So, yeah, we'll see you next week. Bye, Jerry. See you, buddy.